Hey everyone. Welcome back to another video. This story is called Never Cut Twice. Summary, after failing to save Sasuke, Naruto escapes the village. Now alone, on the run, and wielding the sword of the demon of the mist, Naruto tries to rebuild his life as a ninja. If that means working with the fish-like man and the brother of his foolish old teammate, then so be it. And since when did those two become overly powerful funny goofballs? Naruto x Tamari pairing. Quickly before the video though, I want to give huge thanks to my Patreons for their continuous support over the past few months. Without you guys, these videos would be impossible for me to make, especially now with all these crazy restrictions YouTube continues to set for my type of content. I always post the full stories immediately all at once over there, because Patreon doesn't have any problems with my type of content. The full story is already out over there along with 10 or 11 other stories for you guys to enjoy. If anyone is interested in that, or even just wants to send me a direct message to just chat or anything, feel free to check that out in the link in the description. Anyways, without further ado, enjoy the video. Chapter 1, Prologue, Failure The night was cold, and the wind blew steadily over the treetops. On the wall stood a solitary figure, gazing off into the darkness of the forest, his mind haunted by memories. He had failed. Failed to save his friend and failed to keep his promise to Sakura. What was his way of the ninja worth if he couldn't even save those few who he cared about? How many days had it been? He wasn't sure. He spent his days in fitful slumber haunted by nightmares, and his nights were spent exactly as he was now, gazing out into the forest, seeking answers. He let himself drift, reflecting on all that had happened since he passed the Genin exam, trying to find some fault in his actions, somewhere he had gone wrong. There must have been a way to save Sasuke, he refused to allow himself to think otherwise. He thought about Kakashi and Iruka, those who had tried to teach him everything there was to know about being a ninja. He thought about Sakura, who he now realized would never have eyes for anyone other than the bastard, and of the various other people whom he has had the, sometimes, pleasure of knowing. Konohamaru, Lee, Neji Sandaime, Tsunade, Jiraiya, Shikamaru, Kuji, Hinata, and Kiba. He immersed himself in memories. Naruto blinked and looked up at the sky, feeling a drop of water on his face. Within minutes, a light rain was covering Konoha. He laughed bitterly to himself as more painful memories surfaced. Memories of time spent in idle banter with Haku in the forest, of the inevitable fight they fought simply because they were on different sides, and some of the last words the boys had uttered. Please hurry and kill me, I'm sorry that you had to stain your hands, please fulfill your dreams. My dreams, my dream to become Hokage, to gain everyone's respect, and to never take back my words, my dreams are a joke. Naruto broke, he fell to his knees and let his tears mingle with the rain. I've been wasting my time, what would Zabuza and Haku think of me now? I once thought they were evil, but they both died in contentment, fighting for those they loved most. Of all things he believed that to be true, and sometimes, it was all that kept him going. When he seemed doomed, he tried to remember the look Zabuza had had on his face, tears running down it, as he had fought to avenge Haku with nothing but a kunai in his mouth. There had been fury, despair, and love. Zabuza, killer of 100, demon of the hidden mist, had loved Haku like a son, and in return had gotten love, and loyalty above any other. Naruto looked up into the sky and wondered if he would ever be able to understand those feelings, and suddenly felt a need to escape. He jumped off the wall onto the slightly damp forest floor, and dashed off into the darkness. In years to come he would look upon this as one of the most irrational decisions he had ever made, but it was always followed up with a laugh and the comment that it was also one of the best. Chapter 2 a short vacation. Originally, Naruto had no idea where he was going, he just felt the need to run. He pushed himself to the limit, trying to escape the past by exhausting his body. He ran for what felt like hours, the rain splattering on his face as he was assaulted by memories. He continued to run long into the night, and he collapsed under a tree just as dawn was breaking and immediately fell into a blissfully dreamless sleep. Naruto woke groggily to the sound of birds chirping. He sat up against the tree and, shading his face with one hand, glanced at the sun. It seemed to be late afternoon, as the sun was high and the puddles of water from the previous night's rain were already starting to dry up. He stood up and stretched, letting out a long yawn, and took note of his surroundings. All the pieces previous night's exertions had given him vanished as soon as he realized where he was. This was where he had had his first experience fighting enemy Shinobi. He and his team had fought the demon brothers here, and he had, under this very same tree, sworn an oath on pain as he jabbed a kunai into his hand to bleed out poison. He couldn't help but laugh at the irony, he had run right into the hands of the same experiences he had been trying to escape. 
he wondered idly if anyone in Konoha was worried about him, but brushed it off immediately, no one in Konoha would notice even if he disappeared from right under their noses. He froze at this thought and glanced at the path that led to wave country. He turned around in a circle, looking at all the scenery around him, and for the first time in weeks, he had a true smile on his face. Why not, he called out to the empty forest, I could use a vacation, and it's been far too long since I did anything for myself, and it will be nice to see how that bratty Nari has grown. Having thoroughly convinced himself, and with nothing but the cloths on his back and thirteen shuriken, Naruto eagerly dashed down the long road to wave country. Despite his initial enthusiasm, hours of walking had dampened Naruto's spirits. There are very few things, he decided, more boring than traveling long distances by yourself. He was soon playing games with himself, seeing how far he could jump from one tree to another or pretending to be stalking an imaginary enemy, but these were only temporary distractions, so pretty soon he decided to just run again. It took only four days to reach the borders of wave country and it was with great relief that a chakra depleted Naruto flopped up against the side of the bridge that had altered his life forever, and just watched the people go by, waiting to regain some of his stamina. Naruto wandered around the relatively small city that was the capital of wave country in awe. It was completely different from how it had been but a short time ago. Shopkeepers called out into the packed markets, and fresh fruit and vegetables from all corners of the globe filled produce carts. The city appeared to now be a central hub of trade. Naruto's explorations eventually led him to the center of town, where he was more than shocked to see a large stone monument in the middle of a small park. It had a simple pyramid shape and was about six feet high, and each side was inscribed with the symbol of the hidden leaf. After a short prayer at the monument, Naruto realized he had to stop stalling. He was tired, had no food or clothing, and was broke. He knew logically there was no reason to be afraid of Tazana and his family, they were his friends, but he hadn't exactly given them any warning so he was understandably nervous. He eventually did manage to work up his nerve and make his way to Tazana's house, only to find that it was no longer there. With a sigh, Naruto went to a neighbor and knocked on the door. Yeah, what do you want? came the rather annoyed sounding voice from inside the house. Um, I was wondering if you knew where Tazana the bridge builder is living? Tazana. The door opened slightly and a middle-aged man peeked out he moved out a month ago, got into the trade business and got himself and his daughter a better house near the market, who wants to know? Naruto improvised, using mostly the truth. I'm an old friend of Inari, the grandson, and figured I'd visit as I passed through the country. The man shrugged his shoulders and gave Naruto the address. Naruto got somewhat upset when he arrived at said address to find he had passed the very house earlier that day, but he was sufficiently impressed, it looked as though the old man had done well for himself after the bridge was finished. The house was no mansion, but it was three stories and looked brand new. Now very tired of traveling, he trudged up to the door and gave three sharp knocks. Not a moment later, a voice, which Naruto recognized as belonging to Tsunami, called out from inside the house. Be there in a minute, Inari. Stop throwing those knives. Naruto sweat dropped as the sounds of a struggle were heard from within the house, a moment later, a somewhat stressed looking tsunami opened the door. I'm very sorry sir, my son likes to play ninja with kitchen knives and, Naruto. Naruto sweat dropped again as tsunami spun around and yelled back into the house. Dad. Inari. It's Naruto at the front door. The sound of pounding feet could be heard and Tsunami stepped out of the way as Naruto found himself flying backwards, the victim of a tackle hug, and landed rather firmly on his behind only to see a somewhat larger than he remembered Inari grinning at him from his seat on Naruto's stomach. Twenty minutes and two tackling houseguest lectures later, they were all sitting down to a late night snack of instant ramen in the dining room. So, Naruto, what brings you all the way out here? Kazuna inquired not that I'm not happy to see you, but I would expect that you'd be with your team. Naruto didn't have the heart to tell them that Sasuke had betrayed the leaf, so he again used his improvisation skills. I just had some personal vacation time, and decided I'd come see how you were all doing he accented this with his trademark fox grin. Inari grinned back, and Tsunami looked like she believed him but Tazana raised his eyebrow slightly. Well, Tazana said, you're welcome to stay here as long as you like. As you can see, he gestured around, my trade business is booming, so don't hesitate to ask if you need anything. Thanks for the offer, Tazana-san, Naruto replied, but right now, I want nothing more than a soft bed. Tsunami, if you would be so kind as to show our guest to his soft bed, Tazana laughed, we'll let him get some sleep. Tsunami led Naruto up to what appeared to be a guest room on the third floor, and he was more than happy to discover that the bed was much softer than the second-hand junk he had at home. 
His last thought before he drifted off was, maybe I should consider staying here for a while. Chapter 3, Kubikiri Haucho, Ryo, and the Barber Naruto woke up before sunrise the next morning and sat up against the wall. It had been almost six days since anyone had seen him in Konoha. Another ten days before that he had returned from his failed mission. Sixteen days. He could still feel the sting where Sakura had slapped him. Could he really blame her? He had made a promise he couldn't keep, and it wasn't like she owed him anything. It's not like it helped her before. After all, wasn't it Sasuke who had defeated Haku to protect his friend, Sasuke who had protected them in the forest of death, Sasuke who saved her ungrateful ass from Gara. Naruto blinked at where his previous train of thought had taken him. It was rare for him to be this bitter, he had years of practice with being abused. The more he thought about it, the more he realized that no one would cry for him if he never went back. Sure, Tsunade would be sad, but her duties would quickly consume her life and he would be forgotten. Jiraiya had left Konoha again, so it might take him years to even find out that Naruto had left. Damn, now he was just being depressing. Naruto jumped out of bed, looked around the room to see his cloths laying, clean and folded, on a table near the door. He silently blessed Tsunami as he rushed to get dressed. Tazana was peaceful. He was the only one ever up this early, so he spent his time drinking green tea and meditative relaxation. He was calm, one with himself and his surroundings. Then came Naruto. Like an orange bullet, Naruto bounced into the kitchen. Good morning. Tazana san he called, causing Tazana to spit out his mouth full of green tea and glare balefully at the boy who had the nerve to be this energized this early in the morning. Good morning Naruto, would you care for some tea? Tazana asked but Naruto waved him off. So old man, where do you keep your instant ramen? Tazana blinked. Ramen? There isn't any here, I don't like the instant stuff and my daughter won't let Inari touch the stuff, she says it causes insanity. Naruto laughed, insanity? I eat ramen two to three meals a day, and look at me. Actually, Tazana replied, I think you're where she got the idea in the first place. Tazana smirked to himself as he watched Naruto grumble. But, he continued, I hear there's a great 24-hour ramen stand on the corner of 18th and Swordfish. Naruto blushed, well see, I didn't actually bring any money with me, so. Tazana looked at him for a second, and tossed him some money. 1,000 yen, knock yourself out kid. Naruto grinned and dashed out the door, calling back over his shoulder. Thanks oldman, I have a something sto do ice morning not sir when eeled back. The door slammed. Tazana went back to his tea. Naruto sprinted through town and found the ramen stand exactly where the old man said it would be. He hopped onto a stool and ordered three bowls of beef ramen, he didn't have time for a full meal, and while waiting pondered the mystery of why all ramen stands were owned by kind old men with cute daughters to take orders. His musings were short-lived as said cute daughter quickly brought out his ramen. He wasted no time, and a small crowd of people on their way to work had gathered to watch him eat by the time he was finished. Ignoring his fans, he leapt over the crowd and again started to run, he figured he only had about 12 minutes before the sun rose. He arrived at his destination just as the first rays of sun were peeking over the horizon. Everything here was almost exactly as he remembered it, as if this place had been untouched by time. It was really nothing more than a small clearing in the woods, but it was one of Naruto's most important places. It seemed like yesterday, he had carried Haku's body here all the way from the bridge, and he was soaked with blood and tears. Sakura had been fawning over Sasuke's injuries, so he and Kakashi had dug two graves, carefully placed the bodies in the holes, filled them in, and placed two crosses made of bound wood to mark the spot. Naruto had then, with all his strength, taken Zabuza's great sword and slammed it into the dirt. It had also been here, two weeks later that he had sworn to never ignore his heart in favor of what his village told him to do. Those had been some of the most naive words of his life. Kakashi had smiled at him as he said that, everyone Kakashi loved had died for putting the mission first, but Kakashi had had reason to believe in his village, it was a place of belonging for him and it was all he had left. As long as a shinobi had a village, the village had to come first. Considering how Konoha treated him, Naruto wasn't sure he could live with that. As he approached the graves he had his breath taken away. His musings had slowed him down, and dawn was well underway. There was Zabuza's sword, right where he had put it, but the sun's light had ignited the sky and clouds, making the sword look as if surrounded by a halo of fire. Some imperceptible force drew him to it, and as the light reflected red off the exposed part of the blade, he unconsciously reached and grabbed the handle. This, for him, was the embodiment of Zabuza's spirit, everything the demon of the mist had done or felt, had done with this very blade at his side. 
Part of Naruto screamed at him to let go, turn around and run back to Konoha, but his decision had been made long ago, he just had never realized it until that moment. Nuknin, Uzumaki Naruto he said, as if introducing himself to the sword, and with one sharp pull, he drew it from the ground. He held it up with his right hand, and though significantly taller than Naruto himself was, the sword was surprisingly light. He rested the back of the blade on his other hand and examined it. He had never really taken a close look at the sword before, as he had usually been trying to dodge it. The blade was mostly straight with a short curve at the end, the handle was about half as long as the blade, and was wrapped in some rough material as well as having ridges every six inches or so. Both, Naruto imagined, were there to help grip it. In total, he estimated the sword's length at about seven and a half feet. As he looked closer, he saw an inscription. Engraved in the blade, right above the handle was written, Kubikiri Haucho. Naruto snickered, it would be like Zabuza to name his sword. But then again, he supposed, it was also like himself. His examination had only taken a couple of minutes, but the sun was now above the horizon, and Naruto quickly decided that he would need some way to hide the sword before the majority of the populace started to go about their business. He glanced around the clearing again, and with a short prayer and a promise to return, he was rushing back to the edge of town with Kubikiri over his shoulder. He arrived at the edge of town to see, just as he had feared, people getting up and starting to fill the streets. The first thing he saw was a clothing store, so he rushed inside, being careful not to cut the top of the doorframe, and glanced around the store. A young woman who had been working at a sewing machine was now staring rather pointedly at his sword. Hey lady, I have, Naruto reached into his pocket and grabbed his change from breakfast, 508 yen, and I need a 7 foot by 4 foot piece of fabric, what can you give me? The young woman quickly composed herself and thought for a moment do you care about quality? I could give you a piece from the end of a roll, but ends are always frayed on one edge. I don't care about quality or color, but I would like it soon Naruto said nervously. He was hoping that no one had recognized the sword and each second increased the risk. The woman disappeared into a back room and appeared moments later with the requested cloth. It was thick, white, and almost exactly the size he needed. Naruto grabbed the cloth, shoved the money into her hand, spread the cloth over the table, set Kubikiri on it. And stared. It hadn't really occurred to him that he had no idea how to wrap it. The woman, who Naruto now took the time to notice, had a name tag that read Ryo, laughed slightly at the flabbergasted look on his face. Would you like some help with that, she asked, still giggling. Naruto had the grace to blush, uh. Yeah, I've never wrapped anything before and it really wouldn't be good if the cloth fell off in the middle of the city he said a bit uneasily. Ryo laughed again and went to the other side of the table. Within a few minutes she had taught him how to wrap the sword, tucking in the cloth at the end so it wouldn't come loose. During all this time, Naruto was just marveling that he had just walked into a random store with a seven-foot blade and was being treated with nothing but kindness. He smiled at her and grabbed his newly wrapped sword. Thanks, Ryo-san. He called back as he left the shop. Back in the shop, Ryo sighed. She had just sold 2,500 yen worth of high-quality cloth for 508 yen because the boy had been cute, the owner was going to be pissed. Naruto was happily walking down the street with his new cloth-wrapped bundle. He was getting some weird looks but he had decided that looking weird was much better than looking dangerous. With his minor panic attack over, it was just starting to sink in that he was now a self-declared missing nin. Though the decision to leave the village left him much more relaxed, he realized that he had a lot to do. He started to make a mental checklist. First of all, he had to change his appearance. Naruto was not so arrogant as to think he could take on the Konoha hunter nin, so that meant that he had to hide from them, no one could ever recognize him. He also realized with some sadness that he'd have to change his last name. Secondly, he had to learn to use his new sword. This mostly would consist of simple Taiyasu training but Naruto also wanted to learn some of the ninjutsu that Zabuza had used so effectively, most specifically, Kirigakura no Jutsu. Thirdly, he had decided that Zabuza and Haku needed true gravestones, not just the wood crosses he'd make with nails. This would require him to earn some money, which he obviously needed to do anyway, but it also meant staying in wave country maybe for as long as two months, and that would be cutting it tight. Fourthly and finally, he had to send some kind of message back to Konoha, he wanted to give the impression he was dead, so a suicide note would be appropriate. No one who cared about him would have problems understanding why he would kill himself, and everyone else would celebrate, so that would work out well. The only problem would be that the note would have to come from somewhere far from wave country, he would have to think about that. Naruto continued down the street and noticed a couple of sailors staring at his forehead, cursing himself, 
he realized he had his forehead protector on. He rushed into a side street and shoved it into his pocket before hurrying back to Tazana's house, annoyed at his own stupidity, but happy that he had at least some vague plans. He opened the door and walked into the now eerily silent house. He knew that Inari had school and Tazana had to run his business, but it didn't make their absence any more disconcerting. His unease was alleviated slightly when he heard the sound of water running and humming in the kitchen. He peeked his head in to see Tsunami washing the breakfast dishes. He ran upstairs to his room and climbed out the window onto the roof, he found a secluded spot facing away from the road and hid Kubikiri. He then snuck back inside and crept into the kitchen behind Tsunami. He cleared his throat and she jumped, spinning around, only to smile upon seeing who it was. You've got to learn to make sound when you move, Naruto, she said shakily. You scared me half to death. As she was collecting herself, Naruto took a moment to think. He didn't want to lie to Tazuna's family, but he also didn't want to leave a trail. He decided not to tell too much of the truth, he was afraid of Hunter Nin more than he was afraid of Tazuna's discovering his lie. Ni, Tsunami-san, he tried to look embarrassed, I kinda lost my pack on the way here, I really don't mean to impose but. Stop, Tsunami cut him off and smiled at him, father makes enough money that he could buy a new house every week, your shopping expenses wouldn't even make a mark on the books. Thanks Tsunami-san, and by the way, I noticed the monument in that park near the market, do you know who made it? Naruto was hoping she did, he had noticed the stonework was superb, probably someone he could hire to carve the two gravestones he needed. Tsunami thought for a moment, I think it was Soba Akira, he runs a stone and metal workshop near the north end of the city, why? Naruto needed an excuse, and suddenly got a great idea, I was thinking I might stay in the city for a while, and figured I'd need to get a job. I thought that any guy who made such an amazing monument to Konoha would be the kind of guy I'd want to work for. Once again, Naruto had to internally laugh at the irony of his words, but he had gotten what he wanted. So, Naruto started again, would you be willing to come cloth shopping with me or am I on my own in this? Tsunami glanced around at the house, looking a bit harried. Would it be okay if you shopped on your own, Naruto-kun, I really have a lot of work to do today she continued apologetically as she reached into her purse, will 40,000 yen be enough? Naruto was ecstatic, but tried not to show it, that much money would normally sustain him for two weeks, he was determined to save a large portion of it. He realized she had been holding the money out for half a minute and took it, trying to respond. 40,000 yen? That will be more than enough, but I'm not sure how long it will take and really don't know where to go, my cloths have always been pre-ordered and paid for by the Hokage. Tsunami looked as though she were shocked at the thought of someone having never gone cloth shopping, she grabbed a pad of paper and wrote down an address, here, Naruto-kun, start at this shop, the lady who runs it is a friend of mine, if you don't find anything you like there, she'll help direct you. Naruto thanked her profusely for both the money and the advice and soon found himself back out in the bustling streets. He followed the directions on the paper, but started to get suspicious as the streets started to look familiar, he arrived at the address Tsunami had given him only to start banging his head against the nearest lamppost. Ryo sat in her chair staring at the ceiling, apart from the cute boy with the sword this morning, the day had been really dull. She had finished three minor alterations and helped an old lady pick out some socks and was now attempting to count the bumps on the stucco ceiling. All of this essentially meant that she was more than happy for the distraction when she saw cute sword boy smashing his head against a lamppost outside the shop. She walked to the door and called out, Hey, can I help you with anything? Naruto glanced around, and realizing he had once again drawn attention to himself, rushed inside the shop. Yeah. See. I'm looking for some cloths. Ryo blinked, this is a clothing store, care to be more specific? Once again Naruto found himself embarrassed, um, I really can't be more specific, I've never really shopped for cloths before. Now she was interested, never shopped before? Ryo didn't actually find that hard to believe as she looked at his orange jumpsuit. Did you at least have something in mind? Naruto having never had any choice as to what he wore found that if he thought about it and looked around the store, he did have some ideas. He wandered over to the pants and started to pull things off the rack. Ni, Ryo-san, he said as he browsed, do you know of any good barbers nearby, particularly any who specialize dyeing hair? If Ryo was confused by the question, she didn't show it. There's an old man who uses some weird technique to make his own dyes, he can supposedly make dyes that alter the roots themselves, but I don't really believe that. Forty minutes later, Naruto had picked out what he thought were enough cloths. He had two pair of black pants, a couple white t-shirts, a dark navy vest with all the needed pockets, and new sets of sock and underwear. He was well aware that this ensemble clashed horribly with his hair, 
but he intended for that to be the next thing he changed. He left the store, after giving Ryo a 500 yen tip, happily holding the address of his next destination, and wearing his new cloths. He didn't wear a shirt and left the vest unzipped, letting it hang so his seal would show if he molded any chakra. Naruto had a bit more trouble finding the barbershop because the owner had never bothered to put up address numbers and the sign was pretty small. When he did find it, he walked in with every intention of giving the owner a piece of his mind. He took one step in and his mind ground to a halt, the old man was out of within another room but Naruto sensed what was undeniably chakra manipulation. Cursing whatever luck had caused him to run into Shinobi, he started the seals for Cage Bunshine while backing out of the store. He only managed two steps before he felt a kunai at his throat, on the other end of which was a rather pissed of looking old man who had just moved faster than Naruto could follow. After his initial moment of panic, and realizing that he wasn't dead, he looked at the man. He wasn't wearing a forehead protector, that was good, he did appear to be a barber, and that combined with the fact that he was old made Naruto sure this was the man he was looking for, the only problem was the knife still at his throat. So, I hear you specialize in hair dye? Naruto asked, causing the old man to raise an eyebrow. Yes, you heard correctly, though if you're a customer it's generally preferred if you don't perform jutsus in the shop, I like to keep it clean. The man replied perfectly calmly, as if he weren't threatening Naruto's life. So then, Naruto asked, how much do you charge for that special dye of yours? I'm looking for the permanent root altering stuff. The man leaned over and studied Naruto's head. 7,000 yen, 4,000 if you have any good stories. Naruto was confused. Stories? What kind of stories? The old man's eyebrow rose higher, you are a missing nin, aren't you? I don't see a forehead protector, no village I've heard of has a uniform like that, you're too slow to be an undercover onbu or hunter nin, and to top it off, you come here wanting permanent hair dye, so I think it's pretty obvious. When he put it like that, Naruto had to agree that it was pretty obvious. That didn't, however, help with the current situation, so he decided to gamble and tell the truth, he had aversions against lying to people who could have probably detect his lie and be kick his ass. Yeah, I'm a missing nin, though I really just decided that this morning. After a moment of thought, the old man removed the kunai and dropped it into one of the many pockets in his smock, did a 180 turn, and walked back into the back room. What color? The old man called. It took a second for Naruto to realize that the man was asking about hair dye. A dark maroon he called back to the man. Naruto had thought carefully about his choice of color, he wanted something drastically different from his current blonde, but not something he wouldn't like. The man emerged holding a bottle and a bucket and gestured towards one of the barber chairs. Naruto sat as the man rubbed an odd chemical into his hair before telling him to rinse his hair in the bucket. Once that was done, the man took out a pair of scissors, started to trim and told Naruto to start a story. The next hour was one of the most bizarre and interesting of Naruto's life as he and the man exchanged stories of their lives as shinobi. Naruto talked about the mist technicus he wanted to learn and how he hoped to learn them, and the old man told Naruto of missions he had done in years long past. No introductions were made and no names were mentioned, neither even knew what village the other was from, but both felt as if they knew the other by the end of the cut and die. Naruto gave the man his money, a little salute, and walked out the door with his hair now a dark red. It would be hours later that he would find the small scroll in his pants pocket labeled beginning an intermediate stealth jutsus and with the mark of the hidden mist. Chapter 4 Inari, Kitchen Knife Ninja. The third morning, Naruto was awakened by the sound of mayhem on the lower floor. He had been up most of the night practicing Kirigakura no Jutsu. He had arrived at Tazanaz just in time for dinner and had left right after, mainly because dinner had mostly consisted of the various family members ogling his new hair and cloths. He started practicing at the waterfront, and quickly got the Jutsu to work, it was an easy technique when compared to the Cage Bunshine or Rasengan but controlling the mist effectively required a lot of chakra control. What this essentially meant was that he couldn't control the mist too well but he got a lot of it. By the end of the night he had managed to perform the jutsu using only a bucket of water, but he had a feeling it would be a while before he could pull it off using just the water in the air. More important now however, was getting breakfast. Naruto slid on his pants and went downstairs, greeted by the sounds of Tsunami fighting her usual battle to get Inari ready for school on time. Watching her, Naruto figured she would have made a pretty good kunoichi. Inari. She hollered, how many times have I told you to stop throwing those knives? Naruto walked into the kitchen to find himself facing a number of steak knives embedded in the wall. He idly noted that considering Inari's position relative to that of the knives, the kid had pretty good aim. Naruto had the momentary image of a future battle, 1010, 
Weapons Master vs. Inari, Kitchen Knife Ninja. He laughed to himself, causing the room's other two occupants to finally notice him. Oh, good morning Naruto-kun Tsunami greeted while simultaneously trying to get Inari to stay still and eat his breakfast. This, of course, was quickly becoming impossible once Inari noticed his idol had entered the room, so Naruto decided he better calm things down. Ni, Inari, you really should eat your breakfast, if you don't, you'll be late for school, and if you're late for school, you'll be in even more trouble, Naruto reasoned. Inari seemed to process this for a moment, but Naruto made sense and his desire to please both his mother and idol overcame his defiance, so he grumblingly sat down and started to eat. Tsunami looked gratefully to Naruto before walking over and starting to yank knives out of the wall. Naruto-kun, she said as she pulled out another knife, there's some breakfast for you there too, I made pancakes. Naruto was in awe, he had never had pancakes made for him. He pretty much just eaten ramen and kono, crap, he had managed to avoid thinking about Konoha until now. He refused to feel guilty about leaving, feeling guilty led to thoughts about the people who would feel betrayed, and he refused to call what he had done betrayal. Betrayal implied that he owed something to Konoha and the people who lived there. He continued down this thought path and Tsunami could only watch as Naruto looked more and more depressed, she then grabbed him firmly by the hand, jolting him out of his reverie, and dragged him over to the table. Sit, she commanded, so he sat next to Inari and waited only moments before a plate of pancakes were put in front of him. He grabbed his fork and decided to thoroughly enjoy this kind of food while he had it to eat, good food wouldn't be common in a life of traveling and hiding. Breakfast was soon finished and Inari left for school right after. Naruto then quickly helped Tsunami clean up the breakfast dishes and the retreated to his room. Now again left to his own devices, he snuck out onto the roof, and grabbed Kubikiri from where he hidden it the day before. Hefting the sword over his shoulder, he jumped down to the street and headed for the forest. Upon reaching a spot that he felt was sufficiently secluded, he unwrapped the sword with a flick of his wrist, and started some basic swings, trying to get a feel for the balance of the blade. After just an hour, Naruto realized he had some serious muscle building due to. He could lift the sword with one hand, but couldn't control it very well, his movements were choppy and predictable, particularly when he had to reverse direction. Another hour passed and Naruto discovered another problem, his small stature made it almost impossible to do any kind of upward cut. He would need to be at least a foot taller. He pondered over this conundrum for a few minutes, and after some experimentation, found that he could jump while swinging to give him the extra height he needed. Naruto was, as always, obsessively persistent with his training, and he was happy with his improvement by the time noon rolled around. He had decided that on the way back to Tazanaz for lunch he would stop at Soba Akira's shop. It was on the way and Naruto wanted to meet the man as soon as possible. The shop was easy enough to find, and appeared to be just a mid-sized building with a sign out front announcing the place as Soba Stone and Metal Workshop. Naruto jumped onto the roof and had Kubikiri, he didn't want to scare the man. He jumped back down and noticed that the front door was held open with a brick, so he just walked in. Directly in front of him was a rather messy desk, covered in papers and a bell with a label that said ring for service. Behind the desk the room opened up into a cement-floored workshop covered in tools Naruto couldn't name as well as pieces of stone and metal in various stages of carving. Naruto shrugged and rung the bell. A sharp ding. Reverberated through the building and Naruto heard some shuffling. A man in his late twenties or early thirties emerged from the back of the shop wearing a leather apron. He seemed a little rough around the edges, but his brown hair was neatly cut and he had an air of tidiness. Can I help you? He asked Naruto with a salesman smile. Maybe, Naruto cautiously replied. I needed two gravestones for dome friends of mine but don't have too much money, I was wondering if maybe I could help you out in the shop as payment? Soba looked skeptical, work here as payment? Do you have any experience with stone or metal working? Something like that, Naruto replied with a grin, take me to an block that you need a lot of stone removed from and I'll show you. Akira led him to a block of stone five feet high, with lines already drawn to show where stone had to be cut away. Naruto held out his hand and started to mold his chakra in the familiar swirling pattern. He opened the floodgates, pouring chakra into the now reasonably sized vortex in his hand. Rasengan. He called as he slammed the orb into the stone block. It took a little less than 30 seconds to grind away most of the unneeded stone. He turned to Akira who was mumbling to himself with a dumb smile on his face, something about increasing production by 50. Akira soon snapped out of it and grabbed hold of Naruto's arm, I'll pay you 2,000 yen an hour, when can you start? He asked excitedly. Right now, Naruto replied with his trademark fox grin. He would later realize that with his new look, 
said grin made him look frightening rather than cute, but Akira appeared mostly unfazed. Naruto was expecting requests to use the Rasengan again, what he got instead was a two and a half hour lesson about every tool a carver could ever need and the various ways to use them. Though Naruto was impatient, his respect for the man went up a few notches. He was containing his excitement and making sure Naruto knew what he was doing before he unleashed him on the shop. Akira himself mentioned an experience he had had proving just how dangerous sandpaper could be. By the time Naruto's comprehensive tour of the shop was finished, then sun had set and Naruto realized that he had missed lunch again. It was starting to become a habit with him. It was like fate, every time lunch came around something important would come up that would end up taking forever, and here he was, starving by the end of the day. He looked at Akira only to realize that the man had been talking to him while he was pondering his hunger. Having no idea what had been said, Naruto just nodded vigorously, which seemed to be the correct response. So, you'll start work when tomorrow? Akira asked. Naruto thought for a minute, I'll be here at noon, I'm busy in the morning so I'll work from 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Sound good? Akira nodded, yes, that should work nicely. We'll also need to discuss the details of your order. Naruto nodded as he turned to leave, okay then Akira-san, 1 o'clock it is. Akira grinned as the boy ran off into the distance, that kid's weird energy ball thing would cut his production time in half, he was already drooling. Naruto waited until Akira had turned and gone into the shop before doubling back to pick up Kubikiri, it wouldn't be good to forget it. Naruto ran all the way home, as he was now temporarily calling Tazuna's house. The day had gone as well as he could have hoped in better. He now had a job that was both training and paid better than being a ninja ever had. He could even move his plans forward, maybe as much as three weeks. Between the 18,000 yen he had left over from shopping and a month's salary at 10,000 yen a day, he would be set for quite some time. Naruto jumped up to the roof, hid Kubikiri, slipped down to his window and climbed inside. He figured he had 40 minutes before supper and there was something he needed to do. He sat on his bed and took his forehead protector out of his pocket. For the second time that day, he gathered a chakra swirl in his right hand and then carefully used his Rasengan to grind off the symbol of the hidden leaf. He grabbed a kunai out of his holster and, even more carefully, carved in two kanji. He tied it back around his head and went into the bathroom to admire his work. His forehead protector now read Akuma Shinkiro, Demonic Mirage. Naruto had thought a lot about what he was going to do about his forehead protector. Leaving it in its original state would attract attention he didn't want from the leaf, but it was what told the world he was a shinobi, and he had no intention of settling somewhere and finding some menial job. He had finally decided that he would try to build a reputation on his own merits as a shinobi without loyalty to a village, but doing that would require a distinctive look, and he would have to eliminate everything inside him that could be recognized as Uzumaki Naruto. It was in that moment, as he examined and pondered his almost unrecognizable appearance in the mirror, that Uzumaki Naruto died, and Fushichu Naruto was born. It wasn't simply a decision to change a name, because Fushichu had to be everything Uzumaki wasn't. Normal people would consider this as pretending to be someone you're not, but for Naruto, it was quite the opposite. He would have to learn to not to force himself to act a certain way, and he knew it would take a while. He started to practice his facial expressions in the mirror. The first thing he tried was smiling, which he soon found he had to be careful of. A full-blown smile showed off his longer and sharper than normal canines, and although they were great for intimidation, not so good for casual conversation. He tried a scowl or two, and everything seemed okay there, though it was uncomfortable to scowl for more than a few seconds. Naruto continued on like this until supper time, practicing various expressions. This wouldn't have been a problem if Inari hadn't opened the door to call him to dinner during his attempting of the knee sky pose. He had tried to pretend he had just been examining his thumb, but Inari had kept giving him those odd looks all through the meal. Naruto announced during dinner that he had gotten work at Soba's shop to the surprise of all, he didn't go into details, just said that Akira had found a use for some of his unique skills. Apart from his announcement, supper was uneventful, as Naruto had thankfully remembered to remove his forehead protector before coming down. Naruto again quickly escaped to his room, as he wanted to get to bed early and had one more thing to do. He knew what being a missing nin could do to someone, and so he needed rules for himself, a new ninja way. He sat down with a piece of paper and started to write. Never leave a mission uncompleted, he figured this one was a given, but it felt good to write. Never do a mission because you are told or begged to, this was important, as so many missions were a waste of time and he couldn't afford to work on pity. Never go into a situation without knowing the way out, this was a rule he felt too many shinobi had died for forgetting. 
Never cut twice, Naruto thought of this as an analogy for life, always be sure to succeed on the first try because you may not get a second. Naruto looked at his list with satisfaction before folding it and sliding it into the slit in his forehead protector cloth where he had only a short time ago hidden ramen tickets. He then changed and jumped into bed. As he lay there, staring at the ceiling, he reflected on how much his life had changed in a mere seven days. It had been two weeks since he had stumbled into Konoha covered in blood, wasting his tears because the bastard had an unhealthy familial obsession. He had wasted a week moping about his stupid teammates, and in that same amount of time, he had forever changed his life for the better. That night, for the first time in his life, Naruto fell asleep with no fear as to what the next day would bring. Chapter 5, Sibling Bonding It was not a good morning to be a tree. Naruto had now been in wave country a total of 15 days. After Metakira, his days were busy. He would get up, train in the forest with Kubikiri and his new jutsus, break for lunch, go to work, arrive home just in time for supper, and it now being at least 7 o'clock, he had a couple hours of free time, which he usually spent training anyway, before he had to get to bed. This had gone well until two days before when Naruto realized he needed to send his message to Konoha soon or they would come and look for him. The problem was that he needed to send it in a way that it couldn't be traced back to wave country, he knew that if enough effort was spent, someone would remember him and his story would be blown. He needed the Konoha records to show that he had killed himself due to emotional trauma somewhere far away from Wave, so he had come up with what he thought was a very clever plan. He had mailed his letter the day before and had been going insane with worry for the last 24 hours, he knew there were a million things that could go wrong. Unfortunately for the forest, the only way Naruto had found to vent his anxiety was to train with even more intensity, and the trees were covered in large slash marks. On the positive side, he had improved greatly and could now handle Kubikiri one-handed without looking like an idiot. Naruto practiced for another 15 more minutes before collapsing into the grass and staring at the sky, breathing heavily and letting his mind wander. It was amazing how so little time could change one's perspective so much. Naruto had always lived by hating those who killed without reason, and devoting his life to fighting against them, without ever realizing he was being manipulated. What had he thought the Anbu had been doing his whole life? Orochimaru had tried to destroy the leaf and assassinated Sandaime Hokage, but how many innocents had been killed in wars and skirmishes Konoha had started? How many assassinations were performed by leaf shinobi in a month? A week? A day? Uchiha Itachi had killed his whole clan just to measure and improve himself. But the Hayuga had been regularly enslaving and killing each other for as long as village history recorded, and they were among the most respected of the leaf clans. If he added himself, he had the group of people that Konoha despised above all others, and there was only one thing that they had in common. It wasn't their viciousness, their cruelty, or even whom they killed. It was because they had left the village. Nuknins were hunted because once someone escaped the grasp of loyalty their village had, they realized that all shinobi were the same. That their beloved village did the same things they were told made their enemies evil. Naruto glanced at the sun and realized with a start that he would be late for work. He leapt to his feet, his profound thoughts momentarily forgotten as he ran back towards the city. Later that day in the village of the hidden sand. Konkuro very slowly and very carefully examined the house he shared with his siblings. Tamari had a date, he knew this meant she wouldn't be home until at least midnight, more likely one or two. Gara was of doing whatever it was that Gara did, no one had ever bothered to figure out what that was, but he was never around. Konkuro giggled with delight, it was rare for him to have the house all to himself. He was just building up to full-fledged maniacal laughter when the doorbell rang. Konkuro froze, he hadn't even known they'd had a doorbell, if Tamari forgot her key and couldn't get in she just broke the door down, and Gara teleported with his sand. Konkuro opened the door to be confronted by a rather nervous-looking man in brown wearing a UPS hat. He opened the door a bit further, a worker of the United Postal Service meant a letter had been addressed to someone in his house. It was an unprecedented event. Konkuro opened the door all the way and looked at the man expectantly. I, I, I ha, have, have a, the man grew more confident as he continued, p, package for a Mr. Garo of the desert, is he here? The man asked, obviously hoping he wasn't. Konkuro, for one of the few times in his life, was speechless. It took him a moment to realize the man wanted a reply. Garo was upstairs, but this man didn't need to know that, Konkuro didn't want urine on the front stairs. No but I'll make sure he gets it, Konkuro said with a fake smile. The man ran away from the house and Konkuro closed the door, what had he been doing again? A grin lit up his face, now he remembered. He tossed Gara's letter on the table and ran to his room, again checking that the coast was clear, 
he withdrew a DVD case from under his mattress and grinned stupidly over the title. Icha Icha Paradise, the motion picture. It was one of his favorite movies, he knew it was dumb, but loved it at the same time. But he rarely dared watch it with Tamari always waiting for an excuse to beat him senseless. He skipped down the stairs and tossed some popcorn into the microwave, waited impatiently while it cooked and dashed to the living room and dove onto the couch. The movie had only been on a couple of minutes when Konkuro felt a presence behind him. He felt every muscle in his body tighten as Gara calmly walked into his field of vision, over to the recliner next to the couch and, setting his gourd on the floor, sat down. Not entirely understanding what was going on but not willing to waste his Tamari free time, he started the movie again. Konkuro was normally fond of commenting on the stupidity of various characters, but felt insecure with Gara there. This feeling was quickly alleviated however. Don't drink the purple liquid just because it's sitting there, have your brains leaked out of your head, or are you just a stupid pathetic waste of life, Gara yelled. Konkuro looked at his little brother as if he had grown another head, which honestly, would have surprised Konkuro less. Gara was yelling at the TV, at a porn movie, at his porn movie. The next time an appropriate scene cut in, Gara was about to speak but Konkuro cut him off. Why would anyone with a fraction of a shred of a half-dead monkey's brain hit the big red button that says do not push? The two looked at each other, both with a little respect in their eyes. This went on for about the next 30 minutes, when disaster struck. The two heard the sound of the doorknob turning and barely had time to look before a slightly dirty and very pissed looking Tamari stomped into the room. She was yelling something about stupid boys and strawberry Kool-Aid. She stormed over to the couch and sat down, shoving Konkuro over. It wasn't until a few moments later, during a break in her cursing, that she noticed what was playing on the TV. A man and a woman were in the front seat of a car, entangled in a rather odd position while the man navigated the car through a sandstorm with his feet. The room went dead silent, except for the squeaking and moaning coming from the TV. Tamari's eyes widened, that position cannot be physically possible. It was then that the San siblings found the first thing they had in common, commenting on dumb movies. It was the best time they had ever spent together. There was a brief interlude where Konkuro paused the movie too, with the help of some life-sized sand models courtesy of Gara, proved that the earlier mentioned position was in fact possible, if extremely painful. As the movie ended, the three realized that they had just enjoyed a whole two hours of Ak Others company, and were actually sad that the movie was over. That was until Gara reached into his gourd and tossed another DVD to Konkuro. This one was Icha Icha Paradise 2, Revenge of the Squid. Konkuro looked at his brother in wonder. This isn't supposed to come out for another month, why do you have this? Konkuro demanded to know. Gara shrugged and gestured to the still rolling credits of the first movie. Special effects team. Visual effects, Kurosaki Ichigo. Creature effects, Aburai Renji. Sandstorm and weather effects, Gara of the Desert. The two elder siblings stared at their younger brother until he raised a non-existent eyebrow at them and gestured towards the machine. It was well past one o'clock when the second movie finished and they were all heading off to bed, on the way up. Gara noticed a large envelope on the table, and was surprised to see it addressed to him. He took it upstairs and ripped it open to find a second envelope and a note. Dear Gara, This may seem a bit weird to you, but it's really important that you follow the instructions in this letter, if I ever see you again, I'll tell you why. Whatever day tomorrow is, I need you to use Henge to transform into me. Then take the letter in the envelope I sent to the courier and have it sent straight to the office of the Hokage, then go into the desert, release the henge, and go back to whatever it is you do. In a few weeks, people will come by asking about me. Tell them you only met me once, and that we talked about hate and the pain of life and other angsty stuff. Tell them I then disappeared into the desert without a trace. I owe you big time. Naruto. At the bottom of the letter was a scribbled drawing of a stick figure with fox whiskers. Gara woke up the next day and did what Naruto asked, he really didn't have anything better to do, and figured Naruto wouldn't ask if it wasn't important. It also gave him something to do for a few weeks, he needed to practice his angst. Now, back to wave country. Two more days had passed and Naruto was mostly done worrying about the letter, but in its stead got something else to worry about. He had overlooked one thing in his disguise, his eyes. Contrasted to the rest of his dark outfit, his eyes were a piercing shade of blue, and very recognizable. The thing was, he thought knew of a way to change his eye color, but it would require a great deal of research, be very dangerous, and guarantee that he would never be allowed in Konoha again. He did a double take and realized that he really didn't have a problem with any of those. He was really starting to like being a Nuknan. 
Now having spent two and a half weeks in wave country, Naruto started to think about departure plans. Akira had offered to make the two gravestones free of charge and Naruto had set them in place the day before. He had been making money by the bucket load, and figured he wouldn't need to start taking missions for a while, which was good. Naruto had been spending more and more time in the forest, he had gained enough control to make Kirigakura no Jutsu a powerful if not perfect skill and was improving his sword technique every day. It was therein that the problem lay. The more Naruto trained, the more he realized that he had many things to work on. His sword was in need of repair, his working with Akira had taught him a thing or two about metal, and the sword had been old when Zabuza had owned it. He would have to find a master sword smith if he wanted a good job done on a sword this unique, most smiths, even good ones, just dealt with the basic swords, katanas, ninjatos, wakazashis, etc. His second problem was that training his body wasn't enough. He feared the first time he fought it would become painfully obvious that three weeks of experimentation was no match for a 200-year-old sword style. He needed to learn how to fight with his sword, not just swing it. He figured the first one was more important, because he still had his old jutsus and could fight barehanded, but sword experience was useless if your sword was broken. Now hoping to leave wave country in less than 10 days, Naruto threw himself into his training even more, and added into his daily schedule an hour at the local library. It wasn't as extensive as Konoha's, but Naruto found enough books on seals to give him a pretty good idea of what he would have to do to change his eye color. It wouldn't be particularly complex, just insanely dangerous. Naruto made a note to test this particular jutsu somewhere far away from, well, anything. With his having roughly planned his departure date, time sped by even faster. Before he knew it, his fourth week in wave country was coming to an end. Today was Friday and Naruto planned to leave this Sunday. That meant today would be his last day working for Akira, and Naruto was surprised to find that he would miss the man. As today was his last day, he felt there was a question to ask, but he wasn't quite sure how to do it. Naruto had been careful to never give any indication as to why he was here, and for all Akira knew, Rasengan could be a beginning-level jutsu. Naruto approached what passed for his boss's office and fidgeted for a moment. Akira glanced up, is there something I can help you with, Naruto? He asked. Yeah. I've already told you that I'm leaving Sunday, but before I go, I need you to promise never to repeat any of this and answer a question without asking why. Akira gave him an odd look, but nodded. I want to know who the best sword smith on he continent is, and where I could probably find him. Naruto let out a breath. If Konoha Hunter Nin were given the answer to this question and knew he had asked it, he would be thoroughly screwed. Then, to Naruto's surprise, Akira laughed. That's what you wanted to ask. I was afraid there for a second. It's really an easy question, Kirin is by far the best. No one knows his last name, but he was the youngest of three brothers, all of whom were forced to flee from the hidden mist when the oldest went rogue. Kirin himself made four of the seven legendary mist swords, and the middle brother, now dead, made the other three. It's quite a well-known tale in the metalworking community, Kirin is somewhat of an idol. Akira took a breath and looked uncertain for a moment. Finding him may be more difficult, he was last known to have taken shelter in another village in the north. Some claim a place called the Village of the Hidden Sound, but I don't honestly believe such a place exists, so all I can tell you is go north. It was at this point that Naruto stopped listening. The fates, he decided, had a very twisted sense of humor. Naruto waved goodbye to the man who had been his boss and friend for the better part of a month and headed straight home. He hadn't told Tazana of his plans to leave and didn't intend to. Naruto would be gone long before sunrise the next morning, and would leave an apologetic note, claiming that a top-secret mission required his presence immediately. A PS reminded the family not to admit to anyone that he had been there, not even his own teammates. Naruto went to sleep that night with a sense of trepidation. Now having a solution, though a potentially unpleasant one, to the dilemma of how to repair Kubi Kiri Haucho, he had set his sights on how he might improve his proficiency with it. A regular sword master could teach him some basic forms, but Zabuza had not needed a style, he had simply fought with the sword as an extension of his body, and for Naruto to have any less skill would be an insult to the sword and its previous master. Naruto needed to learn from someone who knew and understood how fight with a weapon of this size. They would have to have no associations with any hidden village friendly to Konoha, and ideally, they would also know the various water jutsus that complemented the use of such huge weapons. The longer Naruto thought about this, the more it disturbed him. The problem wasn't that he didn't know anyone who fit these criteria, the problem was that he did. Bonus. Naruto's new look, stealthy and stylish. Hair, maroon. Vest, navy. 
Pants, black. Why these three colors you ask? All three are very distinctive in light, the hair looks red, the vest blue, and the pants black. But when night rolls around or visibility gets bad, say, in thick mist, all the colors just look dark. Anyone describing Naruto to an authority or a hunter nin would describe the cloths as dark or black. People tend to make a noticeable mistake in these situations. When told, his cloths were dark, they tend to automatically assume the cloths were all the same color. The next obvious question is, why the vest with no shirt underneath? To which the answer is also quite simple. Fighting with an 80-pound sword requires mobility, and if one isn't going to wear any armor, why bother with a shirt? The ninja vest is really a requirement, but anything else is just something to get in the way. It should be noted that Zabuza never wore anything on his upper body, but he had Haku to carry all the emergency supplies, the open vest also allows his seal to show, which adds to his intimidation. Chapter 6, Collecting Rent The next morning, Naruto woke up at 3 a.m., he carefully and quietly packed his few possessions into a small duffel bag Tazana had given him to keep his clothes in. He zipped it up and crept downstairs. He left his note sitting on the kitchen table, where Tazana would undoubtedly find it when he came down for his morning tea. Saying a silent goodbye to the house and the people who live there, he walked out of the house, closing the door behind him. Kubi Kiri Haucho was, as always, exactly where Naruto had left it on the roof. Naruto had started to feel more comfortable with the sword nearby and felt nervous when it wasn't within his range of perception. Naruto stood atop the house and looked around at his surroundings. He imagined all the sleeping citizens of Wave Country completely oblivious to the one who would be leaving them tonight. Naruto jumped down from the roof and started to run. He ran out of the city into the forest much as he had run from another city but a short month ago. But there was a difference. As he had fled Konoha, he had been plagued by memories of the past. But this time, as he left the still sleeping port city behind him, his thoughts were on the future. As the morning plotted on, Naruto continued to run through the forest. He was now in fire country, and probably would be for quite some time. It was the only direct land route from wave to sound and Naruto wasn't good with ships. Going the most direct way would take him within 40 miles of Konoha, but Naruto wasn't prepared to be that cocky yet, so he had planned a slightly out-of-the-way route that would keep him a safe distance away. As the sun rose towards the peak of its path and noon approached, Naruto realized he'd been stalling long enough. After all, it had been hours since he had seen any signs of human life. Stealing his resolve, he set down his bag and sword on he ground near a particularly tall tree and ran another minute through the forest. Sweaty and out of breath, but by no means out of stamina, Naruto sought to calm himself. He was about to attempt an experimental jutsu, and wanted to at least be calm so he didn't make any mistakes. He closed his eyes and calmed his spirit. His eyes shot open and in one fluid motion, he bit his thumb and streaked a line of blood down the seal on his belly. He moved his hands faster than the normal human I could track there were 37 hand seals. He finished on the dragon seal, and called out to the empty forest. Shikafuge in Kai. He found himself in the familiar landscape of his cave-like mind. He had been expecting this, but it unnerved him nonetheless, particularly considering what he was expecting at the end of the tunnel. He walked into the large room that held the Kyuubi's cage. The jutsu had worked and he had used enough chakra. The evidence of this was that as was flying around the room, forming a swirling vortex of blue energy, and as he watched, the seal holding QB in his cage started to glow and stretch and the great iron doors started to open. What are you doing, brat? QB's voice called, sounding as confused as Naruto had ever heard QB sound. The seal stretched more and more and the gates opened wider and wider, the demon figured he had to be suffering some kind of mental breakdown, but wasn't willing to let opportunity escape. As soon as the gates were open enough, QB stuck a paw through the gap and sent it hurling towards Naruto hoping to crush his mind and take over the body. Naruto saw the huge clawed appendage coming towards him and it took every ounce of his willpower to wait as long as he did. As the claw was fractions of a second away from making his body into a demon puppet, Naruto released the jutsu. The blue chakra in the room immediately vanished. The seal lost its glow and the gate slammed shut, cleanly severing the front right leg of the QB, which quickly disintegrated into a wave of red chakra that washed over him. Naruto was sucked from his mind world with the screams of the demon following him. Naruto awoke in the real world to discover a new meaning for the word pain. It felt like every muscle and bone in his body was both expanding and contracting at the same time as a hurricane of red chakra tore apart the surrounding area of forest. After about a minute, the chakra vanished until Naruto was just left lying on the grass, staring at clouds. He slowly drifted off to sleep thinking, for a demon thousands of years old, that fox is pretty stupid.
Naruto awoke to find the sun rising, and realized he had slept for 18 hours. He eagerly examined his body, and was disappointed when he saw that the changes had been minor. He had gained a bit of muscle mass, and grown maybe 3 inches. He also molded some chakra and found that he had gained some extra reserves of that as well. Naruto maintained his slightly depressed state all the way to the location of his stash, because it is then that he saw his reflection in Kubikiri's blade. His eyes were slightly slitted and had become a bit more angular. They had lost their innocent blue shade and had turned to the red normally reserved for when he went into one of his insane rages. Naruto had figured some time ago that channeling insane amounts of Kubi's chakra might enhance his body, but he had needed a way to get that much. It was then that he had come upon the idea of the Shikifuujin Kai. It had stood to reason, that since Jutsus like the Shadow Bind could be broken with raw chakra, it would also be possible to, if temporarily, bend the seal, and trick the Kyuubi exactly as he had done. Many months of research later, Naruto had ditched the idea, he had realized that taking power from the Kyuubi might very well give the villagers the excuse they needed to kill him. In retrospect, he had been right to ditch the Jutsu then, but he was glad he had done the research. All in all, his experimental Jutsu was a success. He was sure Kyuubi would never fall for the same trick again, but his eye change alone was worth it. Eye color was mostly impossible to change without Genjutsu, so he might even be able to bluff his way out of a situation where he had already been recognized. Satisfied and refreshed from his long nap, Naruto checked his map and compass before bounding off through the forest. Meanwhile, in Konoha, the fifth Hokage lay on her desk, with her eyes staring blankly off into empty space. Her face was soaked with tears, as was the letter she clutched desperately in her right hand. She had sent a squad of Anbu to the sand the day before, despite the protest of the whole council, and had spent every moment since dreading their report. She refused to believe that Naruto was dead by his own hand, he had always had such an unbreakable spirit but as the days passed, Tsunade started to remember things. Images of him being jeered at by shopkeepers. Hit by children throwing rotten fruit. Screamed at by parents for asking to play with their child. All these things had also been part of Naruto's past. And Tsunade herself wasn't sure if she could handle that kind of treatment for 13 years. She had been crying for two days, but with these thoughts and memories haunting her, she started to convert her sadness to anger. However she looked at it, this whole mess was Orochimaru's fault. He had been the one to steal Sasuke from the village and shatter Naruto's frail trust. The more she thought about it, the angrier she got. Until she decided that if those Anbu came back confirming the death of her third precious person, she would burn the sound to the ground if she had to do it with her own two hands. Far away, a green necklace lay forgotten in the bottom of Naruto's duffel bag. Chapter 7, Don't Touch the Weasel's Pocky. Naruto sat in the forest rubbing his feet. His boots were lying next to him on the forest floor and he glared menacingly at them. He had only been running a couple hours when his feet had started to sting, and a short time later he couldn't run anymore. He quickly discovered the problem, after bathing in demonic chakra, his feet had gotten larger. Not by any significant amount, only a few fractions of an inch, but it was enough to make his boots pinch. Naruto had expected a slight body size increase, he just hadn't accounted for all the problems it would cause. This, he decided, was the less glamorous side of transformation jutsus. A quick once-over had also shown that he would need to have the hems on his pants let out as they hung a good inch and a bit above his ankles, showing off skin. He had a sudden moment of pity for Kimimaro, the poor guy must have spent all his money on fixing holes in his clothing. This line of thought was amusing, but didn't help Naruto decide what to do about his boots, he was 70 miles from the nearest town. He continued to rub his foot, trying to get the blood circulation again. After 10 minutes or so, an idea finally came to him, he took a kunai out of his holster and started hacking at one of his boots. In 3 minutes, he had a usable if not particularly good looking pair of what he thought of as ninja sandals. He had really just cut the top off his boots and used the extra material to tie his feet into the bottoms. Now again mobile, Naruto got to his feet, picked up his bag and sword and started off through the forest. Some 50 miles north of Naruto's current position, Uchiha Itachi was shopping for Paki. He stood among the many flavors and tried vainly to decide. It was a little known fact that the most deadly nuknin in Konoha history had an obsession with the chocolatey snack. He had eaten three packs a day for years and had only stopped eating them in combat when a group of grass jounin had burst out laughing as he happily munched. Needless to say, he continued to munch as he ripped them to shreds, but after that decided to keep eating and fighting separate. He had abstained from his Akatsuki cloak today and had a pencil carefully tucked behind his ear. He and his partner had decided long ago that Itachi was the one who handled shopping and Kisame was the one who managed their money. That way, 
Itachi got what he wanted and his partner could decide how much of it he got. His pocky limit for the week was 15 boxes. He sat down in the aisle and let his eyes roam over the various shelves, he had to choose carefully, but he was patient, and he knew that the answers would come to him in time. Naruto looked at the sun, he had made good progress. He was hoping to get out of fire country as fast as he could and hadn't even stopped to get new shoes in the last town he had passed through, though this could also be partly attributed to the fact that he didn't want anyone to see him. He continued to run and pondered his high endurance. Weeks of training all morning and Rasenganing all afternoon had given him a substantial boost to his stamina, and he was managing the weight of Kubi Kiri Haucho better every day. Proof of this was that he had been running most of the morning and still had some energy left. Stopping at the base of a tree for a short breather, Naruto tried to decide what he would actually do when he arrived at the village of the Hidden Sound, he had serious doubts about just walking up to the gates knocking. He had no intention of joining the sound, so he would need to find another way in, and knowing Orochimaru, he would have to give something up in exchange for what he wanted. He continued to ponder, completely unaware of the presence far above him in the treetops. Hoshigaki Kisame stared down at the oblivious boy. This was undoubtedly the source of the weird chakra surge Seimata had picked up the day before, but to find him with Kubikiri Haucho. Kisame would have normally immediately killed anyone who would dare take one of the seven Miss Tenken as his own, but Seimata had given some very odd results about his chakra. Kisame never forgot the feel of a person's chakra. Ever. This boy, alone in the wilderness, with a new forehead protector, looking completely different and carrying Azusa's sword was most definitely the Kubi brat. Kisame could immediately tell had it left his village, if not for his chakra, he would never have recognized the boy. He tried to think of what could draw him out here, the only thing in the direction he was traveling was hidden sound. He looked at the sword again and his eyes widened. The boy must have gotten the sword recently, Kisame had made a note to know where it was and last he had heard it was marking the demon's grave. It made perfect sense, the sword was in need of repair, and so the brat would obviously need someone to fix it. A plan was starting to form in Kisame's mind, but for it to work, the boy would have to know how to handle his weapon. He glanced at the sun. Considering the distance to the store and the 15 box of Paki limit, Kisame figured he had about two hours before Itachi got back. Plenty of time. His hands flashed through seals and he whispered, Kirigakura no jutsu. Naruto was just getting ready to start on his way again when he noticed the mist starting to fill the area, immediately dropping his bag, he dove into the bushes, uncovering Kubikiri as he ran through the brush. The mist grew thicker and Naruto jumped into a tree to try to get a better view of the area. He was trying to figure out who could be doing this, and the only answer he could come up with was Mist Hunter Nin, but that made no sense. His thoughts were quickly interrupted as his instincts screamed at him. He leapt off the branch right as it exploded. Two phantoms did a dance of destruction through the forest. A slight disturbance in the mist would be the only warning, and they'd be at each other, exchanging blows faster than the normal human I could follow, before both vanishing back into the mist. The air was dead silent, neither fighter made a sound as they silently stalked one another. Both knew there was no time for attempting other jutsus, the second one of them was off guard, the other would strike. Still somewhere far away, Itachi was reaching for his ninth box of Paki when he quickly withdrew his hand, he couldn't allow himself to be hasty in his choice. Naruto cursed silently as he looked out into the impenetrable fog. He knew he had the disadvantage, Kisame had a better understanding of Kirigakura no Jutsu, and so Naruto was fighting blind on pure instinct. And then there was the small issue of Kisame being a Jounin. He was using every ounce of strength and flexibility he had just to avoid Seimata. But then again, he shouldn't be able to avoid Seimata at all. He ran through the forest trying to figure this out, Kisame was holding back, he knew it, but why? And for that matter, why was the shark man here in the first place? Naruto had no more time for thought as Seimata came hurling out of the mist. He jumped over where he knew Kisame was standing and twisted in mid-air, bringing Kubikiri around to block the inevitable follow-up strike. But it never came. Realizing he'd been tricked, Naruto tried to compensate, but he was off balance and landed poorly. The last thing he felt was an impact on his left arm. The mist slowly cleared as Kisame looked thoughtfully at the unconscious boy. The fight had taken less than two minutes, and in that time, Naruto had demonstrated that he had absolutely no idea how to use his sword, and that was exactly why Kisame had been so impressed. The brat had held him a bay for two minutes, and even with Kisame holding back more than two-thirds of his power, that was still quite a feat. Sighing, he picked up the boy and slung him over his shoulder before stooping to pick up Kubikiri. Itachi wasn't going to be happy about this, so Kisame had a feeling that he would have to double next week's Pocky budget. 
Naruto's first thought as he started to come around was that he must be in heaven, because his nose was full of the smell of fresh ramen. Just as he was opening his eyes, however, the ramen was taken away. Wake up, brat Kisame said impatiently, we need to have a little talk before Itachi gets back. Naruto was suddenly fully awake and examining his surroundings. He was relieved to see both Kubikiri and his bag in good condition. He was less pleased, however, with being tied to a tree and towered over by an annoying shark man. He would later think up many things he could have said at this moment, but settled for the first thing that came to mind. Why aren't I dead? Naruto asked. Kisame didn't even miss a beat, because I need to ask you some things, he replied. Naruto blinked, he supposed that made sense. Ask away. Kisame started simple, he grabbed Kubikiri and held it out in front of Naruto, where did you get this? Naruto went over his options, and decided this was another case where his don't lie to people who can kick your ass theory applied. See chap.3, he also realized that explaining where he got the sword would only make sense if he explained why he had left Konoha. One thing led to another, and Naruto spent the next 10 minutes essentially summarizing everything that had transpired in the last month and a bit. Kisame had been silent the whole time, but was ecstatic. This would be perfect, the situation couldn't have worked out better if some had planned it. Author twiddles his thumbs innocently. Tell you what, Kisame said, I'll give you some help with your atrocious sword skills and help you get into Hidden Sound to find Hoshigaki Kirin, and all I want in return is for you to help me out with something. Naruto started to say something, then stopped as he noticed Kisame's smirk and reprocessed what he had just said. Oh! Was the most intelligent reply Naruto could come up with. So, Kisame started again, do we have a deal, brat? Naruto realized that even if he hadn't needed help getting into sound, he really didn't have a choice in the matter seeing as how he was tied to a tree and helpless. He nodded slowly. Good, Kisame said with a grin. He cut Naruto's bindings that set the bowl of ramen in front of the ravenous boy. Eat quick, brat, Kisame called as he tossed Naruto some chopsticks. Itachi left the store and headed back to camp satisfied, it had taken him 3 hours and 43 minutes, but he had decided on what flavors he wanted. He was munching on a stick of white chocolate cream when he came upon the scene of a young boy with red eyes practicing with a giant sword in the middle of his camp. Itachi pulled out his box of Pocky and carefully read the ingredients, but nothing seemed suspicious. He looked again, the boy was still there, he activated his Sharingan, and the boy was still there. He was about to introduce one of his kunai to the boy's neck when he felt Kisame land beside him. He turned and glared at his partner. Explain. Kisame then once again summarized the summary Naruto had given him just a few minutes before, finishing the explanation with, so he can get what he wants from my brother and we get a reliable agent in the hidden sound. Everyone leaves happy. Itachi thought for a moment. As much as he hated to admit it, and he most definitely hated to admit it, Kisame had a point. It was rare, but not unheard of for Akatsuki to work with other missing nins, and this boy might save them a lot of trouble. Every 18 months, Kisame and Itachi took a break from Akatsuki work to go visit Hoshigaki Kirin, Kisame's brother. Kisame went to get his sword checked and fixed, and Itachi just went because it was a break from working all the time. At the end of every visit, they would agree on where they would meet the next time. Unfortunately, Mist Hunters had forced Kirin to flee from the agreed location and seek sanctuary in the Hidden Sound. This posed a slight problem as it was unlikely Orochimaru would let the two strongest members of the Akatsuki Nine just waltz into his village for a quick visit with his new best weapon smith. They had been planning on getting a sound jounin to deliver a message for them. Find a squad and kill all the members but one, then threaten the last one until he did what they wanted. This had worked before, but was messy and left a trail. Kisame actually cared about his brother and had been concerned that this method might put him in danger. Kisame had suspected that Naruto might be looking for his brother as soon as he saw Kubikiri Haucho, and had decided that he would be a far better agent. First of all, Naruto had no reason, or, less of a reason, to betray them. Second of all, Naruto needed the help of Kisame and his brother if he ever wanted to be more than an amateur with a beat-up sword. Thirdly, he had a valid reason to be in the Sound Village and to talk to Kirin. The final, and perhaps greatest advantage was that Fushichu Naruto didn't exist. No matter how deep they delved or how far they searched, no one would be able to find any trace of anyone with his name or description. He had no home village, no friends, no past. Kisame went over all this and the only thing that stopped Itachi for immediately agreeing was that this boy had been the target of a failed mission, and Itachi hated to fail missions. The council had been annoyed with them for weeks. Itachi's internal war finally ended with him agreeing to work with the brat. The boy was, after all, now a missing nin 
and if they didn't help each other out once in a while the villages would kill them of one by one until no one would have the courage to leave. The other, and far more important reason was that the two Akatsuki really needed someone's help, but Itachi would never admit that to himself. Naruto had known the two were somewhere nearby, but that didn't stop him from jumping slightly as two forms emerged from the forest. He blinked. The last time they had met, Naruto had been overcome by Itachi's sheer aura of power, turned out that effect was diminished slightly when he was without his cloak and carrying shopping bags. Now, instead of looking like an incarnation of death, he just looked like an older version of Sasuke with a Paki addiction. Dinner that evening was awkward at first. This was primarily due to the fact that shortly after sitting down, Naruto came to a startling realization. S-class missing nins were people. It had come as the greatest shock of his life when Itachi had set up a campfire and started to fry some meat in a pan. Their food was simple, noodles and fried chicken, but Itachi turned out to be a very good cook. Naruto was surprised again when the two Akatsuki started to chat about pointless non-death related things. Contrary to what he might have thought, the older Uchiha was far more talkative than his younger brother had been. After a while, Naruto found himself getting used to the idle way the two deadly shinobi discussed the next day's meals between bites of chicken. He even started to add the occasional comment to their conversation. Supper was quickly finished and the topic of discussion turned to their task, Naruto now actively joined in. Kisame was tired of watching his brother run, but the only way to get the hunters off his trail was if they believed he was dead. So their task was twofold, they had to get Kirin out of the hidden village of sound undetected, and make it look as if he had died in a way such that the body could never be recovered. If so much as a single sighting of Kisame or Itachi were made, the plan would be blown, as everyone would suspect a plot. Unfortunately, Kirin's connection to members of Akatsuki was far better known in the world of Shinobi than it was in the world of metalworkers. That meant that everything would hinge on Naruto. They decided he would infiltrate the village as who he was, a young man looking to get his sword repaired. Unlike most hidden village leaders, Orochimaru allowed Nuknins to both live in and visit his village. Some took missions, others didn't, but Orochimaru figured that they would help if the village were attacked. It was like having a free defense force, people fighting to protect the sound not because they were paid to, but because it was the only place that would accept them. It was sad and brilliant at the same time. It was decided that Naruto would pose as a child of one of the Miss Nin who had run away with Zabuza. He would claim that his father had been killed recently. This story, combined with a few bribes, would allow him to enter the village with minimal attention. The three continued to plan long into the night, unaware that somewhere far away, another plan was in the making. Gara stood before the Hokage with his siblings, giving his report. Surrounding him were the few in the village interested in Naruto's fate. He had been speaking for just over an hour, and from his first word he had every ounce of attention in that room focused on him. He wove a tale of sadness and depression so dark it tore at the heartstrings of even the most cold-hearted Jounin. It was a tale of a broken boy who had come to see the only other person on the planet like him before he threw his life into the sands of the desert. He described the conversation he had had with Naruto in minute detail, every word, every facial expression, and every gesture. It was all, of course, a complete lie. Finally, he finished with, then I saw his form slowly vanish into the desert. Gara took a step back, very proud of himself. He wouldn't doubt that he had just given the best angsty speech anyone in the room had ever heard. Though he admitted that watching Rock Lee sob and hug his teacher for an hour had unnerved him a little bit. It had only been moments after the Anbu arrived at his door that he realized what Naruto had done. He had wondered the whole way here whether he would be able to lie to the Hokage herself. Then he had seen the parties in the streets. Bars offering free liquor, huge signs waving in the wind reading ding, dong, the demon's dead. Most of Konoha was celebrating. A few people were indifferent, and here, in this room with him, were the only ones who felt even a tinge of sadness at the thought of Naruto being dead. His eyes roamed around the room. The Hokage had started to cry silently halfway through his story and the man called Jiraiya was holding her hand. The elder Hayuga child had his eyes tightly shut was evidently trying to hold his emotions in check while his younger sister, or cousin, Gara wasn't sure, clung to him, sobbing. Noticeably missing were Naruto's remaining teammate and teacher. Gara glared. How dare these people think they had the right to be sad? Where did they think they had been when Naruto had needed them? The people of this village didn't deserve the truth. Gara continued to be angry even after the Hokage composed herself and thanked him. It was Orochimaru's fault. It followed in Tsunade's mind that Sasuke had left because of Orochimaru, and Naruto had, she had trouble even thinking it, killed himself because Sasuke had left, therefore, it was Orochimaru's fault. 
Tsunade stood and looked at the few gathered before her. There has been, she declared, far too much sadness in this village. So much that it will be many years before life gets back to normal. But in this time, I ask you to be strong, and help me to eliminate the source of this sadness. Tsunade slammed her fist into her desk, shattering it. I want every available shinobi called in from whatever mission they're on, from the Anbu to the Genin, I want them all here. She turned to Shizun, get our strategists working on a plan. One month from now, we will crush Orochimaru and his village of sound, and end this circle of sadness forever. The Hokage spun and stormed out of the room, leaving a stunned audience behind her. Shikamaru sighed, troublesome. Back in the forest, Naruto lay sleeping silently near the now extinguished campfire. Deeper in the woods, Itachi and Kisame were washing their clothes in the river by moonlight. They were silent for the first few moments, each having things to contemplate. Itachi looked at his partner and decided he needed to break the silence. Don't even start thinking about it Kisame, the council would never allow us to have a dependent, he would just slow us down. Kisame growled slightly as he tried to get a sweat stain out of his shirt. I'm perfectly aware of that, but looking at him is a lot like looking into the past, isn't it Itachi? Itachi could only nod. He remembered well what it was like during his first year as a missing nin. It had been hard, and he had been a jounin when he left. Naruto was Chonin level at best. No, he knew all too well that once Konoha found out Naruto was alive, and they would, eventually, the next few months after would probably be the most difficult of Naruto's life, if he were still alive at the end of them. Kisame cut into Itachi's thoughts, we could at least help him get stronger and teach him enough to survive, he said, it's three days to hidden sound if we move quickly, but we have all the time we need, so why not take two weeks and teach him a few tricks, then we go our separate ways after we're done in sound and the council won't even need to know he exists. Itachi gave no response to Kisame's suggestion, but it didn't matter. They had both known he'd agree before the words had come out of his partner's mouth. It had been said once that if you looked as missing Nin society as a whole, it functioned very much like a hidden village. Mission information was carried by rumors instead of scrolls, but there were definite ranks and the older Nins often passed on their experience to the younger ones. Itachi now understood why that was. Not out of any particular like for Naruto personally, but because in looking at him, Itachi inevitably saw some part of himself. Bonus, physics of big-ass swords. Having a decent knowledge of rotational motion is a necessity for any decent swordsman. The first fact is that the distribution of mass is very important. The further the mass is from your body the more energy needed to move the sword. But then enters the law of conservation of energy. Say you want to swing the sword around in a circle once, 360 degrees, in one second. And say that, if you hold the sword at the end of the handle and away from your body, it takes 5 units of energy to swing it. If you hold the sword at the top of the handle, near the hilt of the blade, and close to your body, it will only take 3 units of energy to move the sword around in a circle. But since energy can never be created or destroyed, under normal circumstances, if one were to start swinging the sword at arm's length, giving it 5 units of energy, and then pull the sword in close to your body, the swing will actually speed up to compensate. The opposite is also true, if you start a swing in close to your body then extend your arm, the speed of the strike will decrease. Chapter 8, Ironic. The next morning, Naruto was kicked awake at 5.30 and told that he had to get up and train. Kisame handed him Kubikiri and started dragging the still groggy Naruto out to a clearing, he then drew Seimata and started to explain. Okay, brat, listen up. Itachi and I don't think you're ready for this mission yet, so you're going to be getting a two-week crash course on how to be a missing nin. Your mornings will be spent doing taijutsu and swordsmanship training with me, and your afternoons will be devoted to Itachi teaching you the more general skills you'll need to stay alive. With no more words, Kisame charged. Caught unaware, Naruto was slammed fully awake as he tried to parry Kisame's first strike. Tried being the operative word. He was thrown backwards by the force of the blow. The next two hours were spent pretty much like that. Kisame attacked from somewhere, Naruto tried to block. It took 45 minutes for Naruto figured out that this was not strength, but creativity and instinct training. Naruto figured out early on that he could never overpower than Shark Man, but he found there were tricks he could use. After trying to deflect Shuriken with his sword the way he would with a kunai the first few times, he realized that if he turned the sword sideways, it was wide enough to shield him completely. He also found that the best way to block Kisame's attacks was to counterattack. If they both charged each other at the same time, Kisame would lose the momentum advantage he had when Naruto was just standing there, waiting for the impact. Sometime around 7.30 they had breakfast, Kisame and Naruto had bacon and eggs, 
Itachi had orange Paki. Right after breakfast they were back to training, only this time Kisame was actually teaching. He took Naruto through the basics of holding and swinging a sword, and then taught him some basic routines to practice. Kisame felt this was very important, because he had seen some moments in their pre-breakfast practice where Naruto had pulled off a truly amazing block, only to be overpowered because he was holding the sword in the wrong place or at the wrong angle. By the time lunch rolled around, Naruto was exhausted. After lunch, Itachi replaced Kisame, took one look at him, and declared he needed new shoes. Naruto was still wearing his now rather beat-up impromptu sandals he had made from the remains of his boots. It was for this reason that Naruto found himself in a shoe store in the nearest town an hour later. Naruto had complained that it was a long run for shoes until Itachi mentioned that he sometimes ran for half a day to get his weekly Paki supply. Naruto blindly picked out a pair of boots, which Itachi carefully examined before nodding. Naruto paid for the shoes and they ran all the way back to camp. Naruto, now completely wiped, glared at Itachi across what he had now come to call the training field. Suddenly, without warning, the old Itachi was back, the one that used to give him nightmares. Naruto's body ceased to function as every part of him screamed for him to run, but he couldn't move. Just as quickly, the feeling was gone, and Naruto looked at Itachi in awe as the Sharingan user pulled out a stick of banana cream Paki and started to eat it. Today's lesson, Itachi said between bites, is for you to figure out what I just did, I'll repeat it as many times as you like. And he did just that. The first few times, Naruto was just as shocked and frozen as the first. But slowly, as the afternoon went on, he started to resist the feelings, and as he did, he started notice little things. The way Itachi shifted his posture slightly. The way his eyes narrowed. The way he angled his head. The way his muscles tightened. The list went on and on until suddenly, Naruto's eyes widened in understanding. Itachi wasn't moving, but somehow. It's everything, Naruto said, you're changing everything. Itachi nodded slightly. Orochimaru calls this killing intent, he said, but what it really is, is the accumulation of fear stimulus. Seeing the blank look in Naruto's eyes, Itachi tried to come up with another way to explain it. What do people do when you glare at them with your red eyes? Itachi asked. They get afraid? Naruto responded hesitantly. Exactly. And what do they do when you bare your fangs at them? Itachi asked again. Um, they get more afraid Naruto responded, wondering where this was going. Itachi continued on, right again. But, Naruto, we are a race that has huge numbers of instincts that we never need to use anymore, instincts left over from when we were primitive hunters. And there are over a hundred more subtle movements that automatically set off a fear reaction in humans. Naruto felt a chill run down his back and Itachi continued on. I just shifted my weight as if I was going to attack, and I'm sure you felt some fear? Naruto nodded. So if I were to do 40 or 50 small motions at once, each of which triggered a small fear reaction. They would build up into a paralyzing terror. Naruto finished. Naruto though about it for a moment, then grinned, exposing his fangs. Teach me. Naruto spent the rest of the day subjected to Itachi's fear stimulus, as it was explained that he couldn't learn the technique himself until he was fully able to resist its effect. Naruto had absolutely no energy by the time supper rolled around and went to bed especially early, as Kisame's smirk promised another 5.30 wake-up. It was in this way that the first week passed, and at this time, both his teachers were impressed with his progress. He wasn't a genius by any means, but his incredible endurance and work ethic made up for it. In six days' time Naruto had learned the basics of handling his sword, and had refined and smoothed his motions. He had also learned 15 of the 36 fear stimulus Itachi was planning on teaching him. He had yet to successfully use them all together, but he was working on it. On the seventh day, it was time for Itachi to go shopping for food and Paki, and it was decided that Naruto would accompany him. On the way to town, Itachi started a conversation about dealing with clients as a missing nin. So say you find out that a client wants to meet you at a certain place and time, Itachi said, what do you do? Naruto thought for a moment, I'd send a clone and watch from a distance, he said. Wrong, Itachi said firmly, don't you think Hunter Nin's plan for that sort of thing? You should go yourself to meet the client, anything less would be insulting, but use at least six clones as sentries. You don't care if the Hunter Nin's find you, if they are stronger than you then you're doomed either way, because they will always find you eventually. You just always want to know when they're coming. It's also good to remember that if you are caught in a sting operation, whoever is posing as the client can be used as a hostage or human shield. Naruto absorbed all this information as they arrived in Own. 
Itachi handed him a shopping list and disappeared to the snack store, leaving Naruto to get all the regular food. Two hours later, both were done their respective tasks, but Itachi wanted to make one more stop. What do you mean, I need a new sword wrapping? Naruto growled. Your current one is too difficult to remove in combat and falls off too easily, instead of one large piece of cloth that you fold around it, we're going to get you a long strip of cloth to wrap around it, much as Kisame does. Itachi replied calmly. 20 minutes later, Naruto was heading back to camp with a week's worth of groceries and 60 feet of what looked to him like bandages. The only reason he wasn't complaining more than he was was that Itachi had paid. After arriving back at camp, things soon fell back into routine, and before Naruto knew it, four more days had passed and they were on their way to the hidden sound. During the three-day trip, they planned and trained, spending every spare minute in preparation. They stopped a day from the sound as the last 12 hours of the journey Naruto would have to make alone for Itachi and Kisame to stay out of range of the sound's regular patrols. As they sat around the fire eating what would be their last meal together, each was reflecting on the past weeks. For Itachi and Kisame, it had been a unique opportunity not only to teach, but also to spend time with someone who wasn't afraid of them. Everywhere they walked, fear followed, no S-class criminals, not even Orochimaru had the aura of fear carried by Uchiha Itachi and Hoshigaki Kisame. But here was a boy who was not only immune to it, but also impressed by it. In his weeks with Itachi, Naruto had become quite adept with all 35 fear stimulus and could now simultaneously use 12 without screwing up. Both found themselves developing the same kind of relationship with the boy that they had with each other. They didn't necessarily like each other, but they accepted and tolerated each other. And for people like them, that was enough. Itachi looked up from his musings, laughing slightly at his own emotions. He was a man who had slaughtered his own family, and here he was feeling an attachment, however slight, to a boy he had met only weeks before. But then again, he thought as he watched Kisame try to teach the boy to use his new bandage-like sword wrappings, how did someone define family? A large part of it was a feeling of belonging, which Itachi had never felt anywhere until he became Kisame's partner. So had the Uchiha clan really been his family? He was broken out of his thoughts again as Kisame and Naruto wrestled in a pile of tangled cloth. He smiled as he silently watched them. As the last of the fire was dying out, Naruto got ready to leave. He wanted to arrive at the sound at dawn. Kisame just nodded to him as Itachi handed him his bag. It had been a unanimous decision that any of them would deny to their graves what had happened over the last two weeks, so silence seemed appropriate. It would be unlikely that they would ever meet again. Naruto turned, and ran out of the camp. Halfway to the sound, he stopped for lunch and found a box of double chocolate Pocky in his bag. Naruto carefully approached the gates of the hidden sound. The gates were open and there was a small amount of traffic going in and out. Naruto waited for his turn in line then approached the guard. Who are you and what is your reason for being here the guard asked in a bored tone. Fushichu Naruto is my name and I'm here to see a sword smith about getting this, he gestured to the neatly wrapped Kubikiri Haucho on his back, fixed up. Naruto spoke without a shred of hesitation, he had practiced his speeches until he knew them backwards and forwards. The guard looked at him curiously. Village of origin? Mist, Naruto replied. Equivalent rank? Chonin. Time since you left your village? One and a half years. The guard appeared satisfied and waved him through. Naruto entered the village with his heart pounding. The last question hadn't been one they'd rehearsed. The next few moments were some of the most anticlimactic of Naruto's life. Hidden sound looked like, well, a village. He wasn't sure what he had been expecting, but this wasn't it. With the exception of the slightly more rough around the edges look the sound had, it could have been Konoha. Naruto just wandered around for a few minutes, basking in all that was the village of the hidden sound, but he soon remembered that he had a mission, and one that was very dependent on timing. After a few minutes of asking around, he was pointed in the right direction and found himself in front of a house. The nameplate of the door read Kirin but it didn't look like a shop of any kind. Then he saw smoke coming from the backyard. He jumped over the fence and his face blanched. There was no way this person could be anyone other than Kisame's brother. There couldn't be many people in the world that looked so shark-like. He appeared to be pounding on a red-hot hunk of metal, but Naruto didn't see any fire. He observed the man for another minute or two, watched him dunk the metal into a bucket of water, and suddenly his hands were forming seals, Naruto watched in interest. Suddenly the man spoke, Gukaku no Jutsu. He called as he breathed the flame that engulfed the metal. Naruto nodded to himself. Definitely the right guy. Naruto jumped back over the fence and knocked on it. 
he heard grumbling for a moment before Kieran opened the gate, looking annoyed, and glanced down at Naruto and more pointedly at the wrapped sword on his back. What do you want brat? Naruto grinned, he had more in common with his brother than his looks. Naruto tried to sound professional, I have a repair job for you, one probably better discussed in private. Kieran looked at him suspiciously, but let him in and closed the gate. He walked to the back door of the house and opened it, gesturing Naruto to go inside. Once they were comfortably seated in Kieran's rather boring living room, Naruto took the sword off his back and with a flick of his thumb, it had taken hours to master the knot that held the bindings, the cloth fell off. Back in Konoha, everyone was on edge. With the attack force leaving in six days for the sound, kunais were being nervously sharpened all over the village. The sand siblings sat nervously in their assigned room. Shortly after Tsunade's announcement, the sand had sent them a message telling them not to bother coming back, and that the sand was going to send 170 nins to support the Konoha attack on the sound. No one missed the irony of this act. The role the three siblings had been given was containment. They were each given a squad of Chonin and their task would be to patrol the forest and make sure no one important escaped from the chaos that would be the hidden sound. At this precise moment, Gara was feeling out of place. Not because he was a demon, or a murderer, but because he had nothing to polish. Konkuro was carefully wiping down Karasu, and Tamari was buffing her fan with a dry sponge. And all this time, Gara just sat there, doing nothing. Tamari looked at her brother oddly, he had been staring at her hand buffing her fan for about five minutes now. It wasn't helping her nerves. She had been in wars before, but this time she was in charge of a group of Chonin, and most of them were from the leaf. She knew she had the lazy ass and his team under her command, but hadn't really heard much else. Leadership was a responsibility she wasn't sure she wanted, it was more suited to Gara, with his unshakable calm. Tamari spotted a scuff mark and buffed furiously. She supposed all she could hope was that nobody dangerous tried to get past her section of forest. Far away, Kieran was in shock. Kubikiri Haucho he whispered, as if afraid it would disappear. He reached out to touch it, and after getting an acknowledging nod from Naruto, he picked it up and examined it. Where did you get this? Kieran asked. Naruto had practiced this too, I was part of Zabuza's group, and am now the only one left alive. I've started to use the sword myself but needed it repaired. Kiran looked at him carefully, do you know how to handle it? Naruto nodded, I've been practicing since Zabuza died, and I like to think I'm proficient. More importantly, how much for you to fix it? Kiran shook his head, I can't be charged for fixing it, the sword isn't broken, it was just never finished. Naruto's eyes widened as Kiran continued, I was driven out of hidden mist before I could finish it, I had heard it had been given to Zabuza the demon, who had also later fled, but I never dreamed I'd see it again. He looked up at Naruto, I don't want any money, it would be my greatest pleasure to finish the sword, but first I need to see you handle it. Naruto would realize later that showing Kirin routines Kisame had taught him probably wasn't a good idea, but Kirin never noticed. It was imperative to the mission that no one, not even Kirin himself, ever find out Naruto had been working with the Akatsuki, so Naruto knew he'd have to be more careful. Kirin nodded after a few minutes of Naruto showing off but then caught the boy off guard, okay, so you're good up close, how good is your aim? Naruto blinked. Aim? When you throw it. Kirin looked exasperated. Naruto blinked again. He felt really stupid, after all, the first time he had seen the sword it had been flying in the air over his head. Kirin sighed, the boy had shown he could handle the sword. Okay, new condition, Kirin declared, I will finish the sword, but after you have to learn how to make use of its full potential, otherwise, you're wasting it, and I won't allow that. Naruto nodded, it was better than he had hoped for. He found out that it would take five days of solid work to finish Kubikiri Haucho, and that, until then, Kirin was to be left alone. This left Naruto with five days of spare time, he had never had that much spare time before. The first thing he did was find a ramen stand and order twelve bowls, but after that, finding himself with nothing else to do, Naruto decided to train. He found a sound training field and joined those already there. He tried practicing Kirigakura no Jutsu once, then switched to Taijutsu when everyone else on the field glared at him and the mist he was making. He threw himself into training for the next five days, fighting to become as strong as he knew he needed to be if he wanted to survive. In Konoha, shinobi were doing much the same, preparing for a war. On the fifth day, Naruto went back to Kirin's shop, and the man himself walked out holding a cloth-wrapped bundle. In Konoha, Tsunade strode up to a podium and faced her troops. Though hundreds of miles apart, and in very different tones of voice, 
the swordsmith and Hokage spoke in almost perfect synchronization. It's time for you to show me what you've got. Chapter 9, Old Friends in New Places Kieran let the cloth fall loose and smirked at Naruto's reaction. The sword looked mostly the same physically, but the blade. The blade had been stained with something to make it dark, almost black, and unreflective. It somehow made the sword look more sinister. Naruto reached out to touch it but Kieran stopped him. Before you so much as touch this sword, Kieran said, you have to understand what it is. It has changed in many more ways than what you can see. Do you know why the seven Mist Tenken are called that? Why they are called heavenly swords? Naruto shook his head. Because, Kieran continued, they are more than just swords, that is why they are given names, after all. Each Tenken is forged using a number of forbidden jutsus that allow it to contain a bit of its wielder's essence, and its powers reflect that. My brother Seimata can smell and eat chakra, showing our family's rather shark-like personalities. Kieran grinned, showing his pointed teeth, then continued, quickly becoming serious again. But it also means that taking up one of the Tenken is a lifelong commitment, the sword is part of you until the day you die. Zabuza never had that connection with his sword because the jutsus needed were never done, but you need to understand what you're getting into. Are you sure you still want to go through with this? Naruto thought back to his time with the blade over the last couple of months, how it had started to feel like an extension of his body, and smirked at Kirin. The sword is already a part of me, Naruto said, so it's only fair that I give it some of myself. Kirin nodded and carefully passed the sword to Naruto. Now, I'm not sure what's going to happen when we do this, Kirin said, most of the Tenken start looking something like that. He gestured to Kubikiri, when my brother did the blood ritual, his sword grew scales. Naruto raised an eyebrow but let Kirin continue. First of all, Kirin instructed, you need to carefully slit both your wrists with a kunai. Naruto nervously took out a kunai and did so. The blood ran freely. Now, Kirin continued, hold the sword upside down with both hands so your blood runs down the blade, and with the handle still between your hands, copy the hand seals I show you. Naruto did so, and as he finished and held the last seal, his blood soaked into the blade, his wrist wounds healed, and he felt something torn out of his body. He fell to one knee, leaning on the sword as a vortex of red and blue chakra spun around him. He felt an odd burning in his belly and looked down to see his seal spinning furiously, exactly as it had done with the Shikafuge and Kai. Suddenly, he felt the chakra sucked back into his body, but he watched as the outer two seals on his stomach disappeared, leaving only the spiral seal. Naruto panicked for a moment then took a deep breath and felt inside his body, he was pleasantly surprised to find the Kyuubi's chakra still sealed, exactly where it was supposed to be. But there was something missing, and he felt an odd tugging at the back of his mind. Hearing Kirin gasp slightly, he came back to the real world and had his breath stolen from him. The dark blade was now engraved, in the most precise detail, with the image of a blood-red nine-tailed fox locked in combat with a deep blue dragon. A moment later, the name inscribed near the handle started to shift, the kanji twisting and reforming to read. Sere Kirite, Spirit Cutter. As he sat there on the ground, he felt a feeling of confusion emanate from the sword and burst out in hysterical laughter. The sword had taken part of him, but it had also taken the soul of the QB. Fifteen minutes and a hell of a lot of explaining later, Kieran was nodding his head. When he thought about it, it made perfect sense. The jutsu was designed to take part of a person's soul, and no matter how powerful the seal, the Kyuubi's soul would be far less attached than Naruto's own, so the jutsu had taken it. This left Kyuubi's chakra inside Naruto, still happily mixing with the help of the remaining spiral seal, as well a confused demon fox inside the sword. That was another thing Naruto found odd, he could vaguely feel what the fox was feeling and thinking. Currently, said fox was very off balance. For years he had been in that cage, able to feel all his chakra but perceive nothing, now, he could feel things around him, but drawing on chakra was like drinking the ocean through a straw. His feeling wasn't a form of sight exactly, just a perception of things nearby. He also found that he had a somewhat empathic connection to the brat. Naruto was sitting on the floor of Kirin's living room when he felt it, a slight pull on his chakra, and realized the fox was trying to draw on it from inside the sword. Curious, he loosened his chakra control and let the fox take some, the sword started to flicker with a red glow. Kirin walked back into the room to see Naruto holding the sword, which was surrounded by a fluctuating red aura. He sat down on the couch and observed the boy. Kirin had never seen a situation like this before and was fascinated. Further experimentation revealed that the Kyuubi, if given enough chakra, could manifest parts of his body. 
This resulted in no small number of nicks and gashes on Naruto as the fox was still just a little irked about the arm severing incident. It was this, however, that led directly to the next discovery. Naruto could not only control how much chakra the fox got, he could use his own chakra to manifest. Nothing as complex as what the QB could manage, after all, Naruto had to his own body he had to worry about controlling. But he soon found he could send a small burst of chakra from the sword. Kirin suddenly broke the silence, now I get it, he exclaimed. Naruto was about to ask what Kirin got but didn't have time as the shark man just kept speaking. What was it you said before the ritual? That you felt the sword was part of your body. That's the power of your sword, to exude chakra from it as if it were a part of your body. But QB complicated things. That also explains the engraving, the red nine-tailed fox is obvious, but the blue dragon represents your chakra. Kirin rushed on, now completely lost in his own world. The two creatures in the engraving are fighting, but they're also intertwined, much as you must be, therefore, your essence is mixed with the demons and that's what's holding Kyubi's soul in the sword. Naruto looked cautiously at Kirin. Meaning? Meaning, Kirin said, sounding proud of himself, that the only reason Kyubi still exists now that he's apart from his chakra is because he is, in the literal sense, now part of you. You aren't two separate beings anymore, you're one being with two minds and two chakras. As amazingly comforted as Naruto was by this thought, it meant that the fox would have to think twice before killing him, and that was a good thing. Kirin continued to speak, completely oblivious to the mood, now that that's over with, it's time for a sword-throwing lesson, he said with a grin. Naruto glared. He added a few fear stimuli for extra effect. Or, Kirin continued, we could start the lesson first thing tomorrow morning. Naruto nodded, he needed some time alone with his sword. Once Kirin was out of the room, Naruto gave Kyubi enough chakra for the demon to manifest ahead. Naruto tried to play it cool, as if he had conversations with glowing red fox heads coming out of his sword every day. Well, brat, the demon said, this certainly is an, interesting twist. It changes little, Naruto replied, you still need me to stay alive, and since I know how much you look forward to dying, I figure you'll contribute to my well-being no matter how much you hate me. Kyubi laughed, yes, I suppose that's true. And I have to admit, this form allows me a great deal more freedom than that cage your belly and. Naruto cut him off, before anything, let's get one thing straight. We hate each other, correct? The fox head nodded with a feral grin. But you need me to give you access to chakra or you're about as useful as Sakura. The fox flinched, that had been harsh. But I'm stuck with you either way. So here's how things work. You help me fight, which you love to do anyway, and in return, I'll give you chakra. The only rule is that if you ever hurt someone without what I think is a valid reason, I'll cut you off forever. Do we understand each other? I suppose, the demon said with just a hint of annoyance. He was stuck with the brat, so he would just take the opportunities to reap destruction as they came. Fourteen years in a cage had taught him some patience. Naruto sighed and collapsed on the floor as the head vanished. It was only supper time and he was exhausted. The evening was uneventful and the next morning, Naruto was up bright and early, getting ready for his throwing lesson. Kirin led him out of the hidden sound and into the forest, where he found a tree he liked, took Naruto to a spot 140 feet away, and told him to try and cut the tree in half. Naruto failed miserably the first few times, missing the tree or just nicking it, but on the ninth try, he felt that familiar tug that meant Sere Kirite, or more specifically Kyubi, wanted chakra. He gave the sword some chakra as he released the throw and the sword not only cut through the tree perfectly, it also curved around and returned to Naruto's hand. He grinned. The demon could control it using chakra. Kirin was taken slightly aback. Okay then, I guess it's on to lesson 2. Lesson 2 was learning the shuriken cage bunshine no jutsu, a skill Kirin claimed was necessary. Due to his experience with the regular variant, applying it to a weapon wasn't very hard and Naruto picked it up quickly. The only thing was that Naruto called it the Kirite Cage Bunshine no Jutsu, since he claimed calling his sword a shuriken was insulting. The rest of the morning revealed that Kyubi could control nine swords at once, the original and eight shadow clones, all of which he delightedly used to reduce a rather large section of the forest to stumps. By three o'clock, Kirin was out of things to teach, he wasn't really a ninja after all, and declared that Naruto could go. Naruto rushed back town. The operation would start in four days and he needed to be ready. The plan he had concocted with the two Akatsuki was simple. Naruto was going to invade the sound. Not for real of course, 
but enough confusion would be generated and destruction caused that Hoshigaki Kirin's death would be easily overlooked. The problem had been how to make Naruto look like an invading army, but with careful planning, they had come up with an idea that would work and that, over the next three days, Naruto started to put into effect. The first thing he did was pose as a simple workman carrying a bag of fertilizer. What no one noticed was that the bag had a hole, and everywhere he walked some fell out. What people didn't know was that there was gunpowder in the bag, not fertilizer. Kirin lived near the south gate, and Naruto, over the course of almost two days, had enough gunpowder just laying everywhere in the area like dust that the slightest spark would cause some to ignite, but people just passed if off as lighter malfunctions. He switched from workman to repairman and spent the last day setting up shuriken launchers on the tops of houses so that, when triggered, they would shoot the kunai into the air and make them fall in the street looking as though they had been thrown over the houses. Right before going to sleep the night before the mission, Naruto sat and thought, making sure he hadn't missed a part of the plan. The next morning he would wake up at dawn and start his mock attack an hour later. Naruto was going to instigate his invasion using as many shadow clones as he could make, all using henge to look like various leaf nins. Kisame and Itachi would disguise themselves as sound nins and remove Kirin from his house before torching it. They weren't planning on being in the village more than 15 minutes. Eight and a half hours from the sound, Kisame detected what felt like a very large number of approaching chakra sources and quickly woke his partner. Nine hours from the sound, Tamari led her advance team. Their job was to cover the north gate, so they would have to travel around the whole village to get to their positions, and they had to do it without alerting any sound sentries. Nine and a half hours from the hidden sound, Tsunade was leading the main invasion force, they would rest ashore while an hour from the village and attack at dawn. Half an hour before dawn, Naruto was knocked off of Kirin's couch, where he had been sleeping, to see Kisame and Itachi above him, disguised and looking like sound nins. He glanced at the clock, what's wrong? A leaf invasion force will be here in 10 minutes, Itachi said, as if talking about the weather. Naruto looked confused for a moment, a real one? Itachi nodded. Shit, Naruto muttered, this will be a pain, won't it? Itachi nodded again. Kisame left to wake his brother and Naruto got off the couch and started to dress as he talked, so we'll have to fight our way out? Which way? Itachi thought for a moment, north. Assuming that you have everything set up for our plan, the first fire jutsu used in this area of town will light this place up, so we need to get out of the south end before the leaf arrive in, Itachi calmly pulled out a stick of strawberry pocky as he checked his watch, seven minutes. Kisame ran back into the room, carrying a rather annoyed Kirin over his shoulder. Kirin's eyes widened as he saw Naruto with Itachi, but he quickly understood. All three ran out the back and leapt onto the roof. Hidden sound was in chaos, people running everywhere making last-minute defense preparations. All three moved their hands through seals and for one instant, every eye in hidden sound was facing in their direction as together, they called, Kirigakura no Jutsu. The mist started to form. Between the three of them, there had been more chakra put into the mist than was required to summon eight game abuntas, and soon, all of hidden sound and surrounding area was enshrouded with it. Kisame set his brother down and he and Naruto, in somewhat creepy synchronization, drew their swords and flicked off their wrappings. Both Akatsuki raised their eyebrows at Naruto's black engraved blade, but decided to question Kirin later. Naruto reached into his pocket, and carefully tied on his forehead protector, taking time to run his hands over the kanji he had scratched in all those weeks ago. He could feel Sere Kirite pulse with excitement as he looked out into the mist. Without a word, Itachi picked up Kirin and the three shinobi dove into the fog. They ran north silently, each already knowing what they would need to do. At the north gate, Itachi and Kisame would break right and Naruto would continue on. There would be a containment unit of shinobi to stop them from doing exactly what they were doing, and it would be Naruto's responsibility to distract them. There could be no knowledge of Akatsuki, and with the leaf being the attackers, the danger of discovery was even more than usual. They got to the north gate without trouble everyone else was heading south to fight. Just as they were arriving, they saw and heard a huge explosion on the south side of town. Both armies would be completely confused at this point. As expected, Naruto watched as Itachi took a sharp right turn just outside the gate. Naruto stopped atop the gate and looked out into the mist-filled forest. Everything he had done since he left his village was for this moment, to look out over what would soon be a battlefield not as a Konoha Genin or even as a Konoha Nuknin, but as Fushichu Naruto. His face widened into a dark grin. Then again, he thought, to his opponents, he would be nothing more than a demonic mirage. Akimichi Kuji looked cautiously into the mist. 
he had used his multi-size no jutsu as soon as this unnatural fog had rolled in. Less than 40 feet away, Naruto was cursing silently. He knew it was soft, but he really didn't want to kill those few people who had been relatively nice to him. He hefted the eager sword and sent it a clear message. No killing unless Naruto said so. The sword pulsed in his hand and he pulled back his arm and threw. Kuji felt something coming and dove out of the way as it flew past him, it had looked like a huge sword. He was immediately on full alert, looking for something, anything, that would reveal his opponent's location. He lurched once, then twice more as he turned in horror to see three huge blades protruding from his back, each of which turned to smoke a moment later. The large man managed to let out a yell before he fell to his knees and passed out, returning to his normal size. Naruto was already running past him to the next opponent. He knew the leaf containment unit formation, he had practiced it many times himself. Yamanaka Ino knew nothing. Naruto was less than five feet away from her and she couldn't sense him. He circled her until he was behind her, and calmly, with a shallow slice, he severed her spinal cord near her waist and watched her collapse like a broken puppet. She would never walk again, but he figured he was saving her from a grisly death in combat. She was a crappy shinobi. Now there was only one more. This was where he was going to take a risk, but he really didn't want the three dead. He jumped to where the third member should be posted, and as expected, he suddenly felt his body freeze. He knew Shikamaru was somewhere in the mist, he had been sure the genius would find some way to catch him in a shadow bind even without seeing him. This was where it became dangerous. He sent a pulse of chakra to the sword, it sent back a feeling of understanding. He opened the floodgates, pouring demonic chakra into the blade. The blade's aura turned into a giant claw that shot off into the darkness. Naruto heard a grunt and the shadow bind was released. Now came the run like hell part. Every shinobi within three miles would have felt that, manifesting took an insane amount of chakra, even by QB standards. An investigation team would be there in minutes. He hoped it would be from the leaf. But there was one problem. Naruto didn't know it, but he had only practiced containment operations with three people because that's how many were on his team. In the field, it was custom to have a fourth member, farther out. It was for this reason that it caught Naruto rather off guard when a hurricane force wind blasted him up against a tree. He quickly recovered, but found himself in a now missless clearing facing someone he immediately knew he would lose to. Between the huge Kirigakura no Jutsu and the Kyuubi's manifestation, he was drained of chakra. But more important was that despite the fact that he didn't even remember her name, he couldn't hurt Gara's sister, he owed far too much to the sleepless boy. Tamari was bringing her fan around for a second blast when her blood froze. As Itachi had taught him, Naruto did not force it, he simply allowed his body to flow into what the Sharingan master had called the death stance. Naruto recognized it as what Orochimaru had used in the forest, a collection of fear stimulus that gave the target a paralyzing terror and a feeling of their impending doom. She had seen him, and was working with the leaf, he couldn't afford to let her tell anyone about him. His death stance wasn't very strong yet, and would start to wear off after just a few seconds. Naruto made a decision, he had no time now, he would think of something later. Tamari fought to regain control of her body, logically, she knew she was helpless like this, but the fear was still too strong. Suddenly, Naruto sprung into action, crossing the clearing of sliced trees between them in less than three seconds. The last thing Tamari saw was a set of demonic eyes burning into her own. Naruto tossed the unconscious girl over his shoulder and glanced back at the mayhem behind him one last time before running as fast as he could into the forest. Long since forgotten, the remains of Naruto's bag lay in the smoldering pile of wood that had once been Kirin's house, where in a few short hours, a certain long-haired Hayuga would notice a necklace glinting in the sunlight. Chapter 10, Camping with Your Captor Naruto giggled. He knew it really wasn't the time but he couldn't help it, his companion was so, cute. The twelve-inch tall fox glared balefully at him. They were in Naruto's mindscape, standing before the sealed gate, and the miniature fox was getting very annoyed. He momentarily considered biting the boy's ankle, but decided that would just be demeaning himself. What they saw through the gate was an odd sight, looking something like a sunset. The demon's chakra simply sat there, behind the seal, a sea of red energy. Naruto sighed, he had been hoping there might be a way to draw on this ocean of chakra, but with the fox now on his side of the seal, there was no one to push it through, so the chakra just slowly leaked out. As a consolation prize, he got to annoy a tiny demon fox. Within the mindscape the demon's form was maintained by his chakra, so without it he reverted to the smallest and most efficient form possible. It also made him hilariously cute. Needless to say, the demon wasn't appreciating the humor. In what had hours ago been the hidden sound, 
The fifth Hokage surveyed the destruction around her. Lives had been lost, sacrifices made, but Orochimaru was dead. She turned and walked back into the temporary hospital, and started to tend to the ever-arriving wounded. With the death of their leader, the majority of the sound nins had immediately given themselves up. Unfortunately, there had been no sign of Sasuke, but it had been a perfectly orchestrated invasion. Except for two things. The first was the odd disturbance at the northern gate. Three shinobi had been badly injured, one was still missing, but none killed. She had examined them herself, the wounds on both Shikamaru and Kuji were from an unknown source, but Ino looked to have been cut once across the back with some large sharp object. It wasn't a cut designed to kill, too shallow, and it showed too much forethought to be an accident. Kuji had three deep gashes in his back and Shikamaru looked to have had his arm almost torn off by some huge hand but these wounds too were non-lethal. Whoever attacked them had been holding back. She was waiting for one of the three to regain consciousness and give her a better picture of what happened, as Gara had been very restless since the news of his sister's disappearance. The other problem, and honestly, the one really bothering the Hokage was the discovery of the necklace. Hayuga Neji was in the hospital with a rather bad case of chakra burn from using chitin too much, and had mentioned in passing that he had found a necklace that looked exactly like the one Naruto used to wear. Now, when Hayuga Neji said exactly like, he didn't mean really similar to like most people did, he meant exactly like. Tsunade had immediately demanded he show it to her, and he had. It was the same necklace. Somehow, weeks after his death, Naruto's necklace was showing up in the hidden sound. Something wasn't adding up. Tsunade wasn't sure what it was yet, but it was there, that nagging feeling that she'd missed something. She was broken out of her thoughts as a group of civilians were brought in, they had been in a building crushed by Manda. Tamari was floating. Her body was weightless, surrounded by nothingness. Sight showed nothing but blackness. Ears heard nothing but, cursing? Tamari slowly opened her eyes, blinking into what felt like very bright light. Once she was mostly aware and started to take some notice of her surroundings, she realized she was sitting, leaning against something and couldn't move her arms. She was now waking up very quickly. Abruptly, the cursing she had been hearing stopped, and her eyes finally focused just in time to see a set of dark red eyes looking into hers. Suddenly, she remembered. She had lost in the forest but then, her eyes widened in fear, there was only one reason to keep a shinobi alive and awake. Torture them for information. In a panic, Tamari desperately tried to bite off her tongue, but suddenly felt a hand shoved into her mouth so she bit it instead. Naruto grimaced. He knew what her initial reaction would be, but still, his hand was in a world of pain. He grabbed her head with his other hand and forced her to look at him again. First thing, Naruto said in a rather strained voice, I am not going to torture, kill, violate, abuse or harm you, so for the love of God stop biting my hand. Tamari dug her teeth in for another second, and then let go, glaring at who she now realized was her captor. Naruto shook his hand to get the blood flowing again, then smiled politely at the struggling girl. My name is Fushichu Naruto, and yours is? Tamari glared, screw you. Naruto's polite smile turned into a grin as he raised his sword and brought it down sharply. Tamari screamed. He stopped the blade less than an inch above her head. Tears started to form in the corners of her eyes. Bastard Tamari growled. Your name? Naruto said, his grin still in place. Tamari, she spat her name at him, like it was a curse. Naruto considered this for a moment, and then nodded before turning and walking into the woods. Don't go anywhere Tamari-san. He called over his shoulder. Once he was out of her line of sight, Naruto collapsed against a tree. He had never, in all his years as a shinobi, been the one in control, he had always been someone's subordinate. For he first time ever, he was calling the shots and it scared him senseless. He knew the act like Kisame trick wouldn't hold up for long, he wasn't that good at being mean. And anyway, the girl had already seen too much of him for releasing her to be an option, so he would have to keep her nearby until he thought of something else. Naruto resisted the urge to start cursing again. Now alone, Tamari took time to more carefully examine her position. She was sitting on the ground with her back against a tree and her hands were bound behind her. She noticed a moment later that her hair was loose, and pondered this before she tried to move her hands again. The bastard had bound her with her own hair ties. Her fan was also nowhere in sight, something that bothered her greatly as she was almost useless in a fight without it. Just as quickly as he had left, the bastard, as she now referred to him, walked back into her line of sight. Tamari decided that she should start the conversation this time. I really hate you, she said, using her most menacing tone. 
To her astonishment and indignation, the bastard started to laugh at her. Thirty seconds later, he was still laughing and Tamari was thinking he'd maybe lost his mind when he finally calmed down and managed to respond. You hate me? Naruto said between giggles, listen, little girl, there are a very large number of people in this world who hate me, and pretty much all of them are more frightening than you. Hell, I'm more afraid of my sword than I am of you. It was a minor point that Naruto was actually three years younger than the San Nin, but she didn't need to know that. Naruto suddenly became serious, but all that is really unimportant. What is important is that right now, you are in my control, and you are also very pissed off about it. Not getting any feedback, Naruto continued on, I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation, and you need to tell me what you'd do, agreed? Tamari glared. Naruto took that as a yes. You, he said, are a missing nin, one who has protected their identity so well, there are three people in the world who know who you are. Then one day, an enemy sees you, someone who could identify you. Normally you'd kill them, but something is preventing you from doing so. What options are left over? Tamari had long since figured out where this was going, and didn't like the answer she was coming to. Seeing she understood his point either way, approached her while continuing to speak. So as you can see, there's no point in being angry at me since I have no more control of this situation than you do, I can't kill you and I can't let you go, so now that we understand each other. He cut through her bindings. Within half a second, Tamari had a hidden kunai in her hand and was getting ready to stab. A half second later, she was on the ground, her arm twisted around backwards and the kunai now pointed at the back of her neck. Ni Tamari-san, we will probably have to put up with each other for a while, so please don't do that, Naruto said while removing his sword from his back and placing it next to her, I need to go hunt for something to eat, you may move 20 feet in any direction, but no further, and must always have this sword right next to you. He then released her arm and casually walked off into the forest. As was expected, within moments he felt the sword sending him an image of Tamari getting ready to run, so Naruto sent back an image of Tamari restrained by fox claws, along with what remained of his chakra. Tamari almost screamed again. When she was about to run, the sword grew clawed arms and grabbed hold of her. Naruto walked back into the clearing, one more thing Tamari-san, the sword is intelligent, he paused, but I see you've already learned that. He again walked into the forest. Tamari lay on the forest floor staring at the darkening sky, her arms stretched out and the sword lying silently next to her. You know, she said to it, I've always thought of myself as somewhat of an authority on weird homicidal shinobi, but this guy is something else. She sighed, I mean, 24 hours ago I was preparing for a minor role in an invasion, now, my team is probably dead, I'm in a forest somewhere, prisoner of a demon-eyed boy who manages to be polite and terrifying at the same time and being guarded by a sword. Amazingly, the sword remained silent. It's like I'm living a twisted nightmare. Tamari rested a hand on her forehead as she felt a breeze, but suddenly jumped upright as she heard a voice behind her. Is it really that bad? I mean, I know the slitted red eyes thing throws people off but I think terrifying is a little strong. And, he said, drawing the word out, I'll have you know that not a single one of your minions is dead, though I did cripple the blonde one. Tamari glared yet again as Naruto grinned at her. So what are we having to eat exactly? Tamari asked annoyedly, she really was hungry. One dead rabbit and one box of double chocolate Paki Naruto said as he grinned wider and held out both hands. Tamari just hung her head. The boy was crazy. He had to be. She would laugh herself silly at him if he couldn't kick her ass so efficiently. Come to think of it, even his sword had immobilized her without much effort. She wasn't even as strong as his weapon. It was these types of uplifting thoughts that occupied Tamari while Naruto set up a fire and started to cook the rabbit. Food was eaten quickly and both were tired so going to sleep early was the first thing they agreed on all day. Tamari had the sword next to her keeping watch as she insisted Naruto stay a decent distance away even though they were just lying on the ground with their clothes on. They both soon started to drift, but Tamari regained her senses enough to ask the drowsy Naruto a question. In that hypothetical situation we talked about, why can't I kill the one who saw me? He looked over at her, and for one second, she saw something hidden within his eyes. It was gone in the next moment and he smirked at her, that's for me to know and you to go crazy wondering about. It was an answer typical of him, but Tamari was awake for another half hour wondering about that momentary flicker of depth. The morning after the invasion, Tsunade went outside to watch the sun rise. She had been working all night, but their casualties had been far lower than expected. Gara was already outside, Hito had been awake all night, but it was normal for him. 
the two stood silently and watched the first rays of light peek over the horizon. Gara started to speak hesitantly, Hokage-sama, I have a, confession to make. Tsunade didn't even turn her head as she spoke, Naruto's alive, isn't he? Gara nodded. Tsunade felt her hands close into fists. She knew she couldn't fault Gara. Naruto had been the one to make the choice to leave. She felt blood run out of her hands as her nails dug holes in her skin. Naruto had been here, in this very village. She hoped he had gotten out before he invasion, but couldn't even imagine what would have brought him here in the first place. Either way, she had no choice in what she was about to do. She purposefully strode all the way to where she knew Shizun would be planning diplomatic meetings for when they arrived back in Konoha. Tsunade didn't let herself falter, even once. She interrupted her assistant in the middle of writing a scroll to be sent to the various countries informing them of the sound's defeat. Shizun, she said, fighting to keep her voice from breaking, as of right now, Uzumaki Naruto is hereby registered as an A-class missing nin, location unknown. Inform the hunters. Tsunade spun, ignoring the shocked look she was getting, and walked out, fighting her tears. Oblivious to his plight, the newly official missing nin was just waking up, feeling extremely refreshed. A night's sleep did wonders for his chakra supply. He glanced over at Tamari and confirmed she was still asleep before taking a moment to think. At this point, he had two directions he could travel in, east or west. West would take him almost directly to Hidden Waterfall, but he would still be right above Fire Country. East was a long trip, but would take him to Hidden Cloud, much farther away from and an enemy of Hidden Leaf. East it was. He needed time to decide what to do with the troublesome San Nin before he started looking actively for missions, and he had enough money to last a while, though he had lost his extra clothing. Naruto sighed as Tamari started to stir. He really wished Itachi were here, his Sharingan could just awe the girl with their coolness and then she would do whatever she was told. That was one trick the Uchiha had never taught him. He felt a tug in his mind, and unconsciously gave a bit of chakra. He immediately heard a shout behind him and spun around to see Tamari glaring at Sere Kirite. She turned to Naruto looking livid. Your sword just groped me. What? Tamari was raging a glowing red claw just grabbed my ass. Naruto looked at her skeptically, but then he started to get a feeling of satisfaction from QB. Naruto pinched the bridge of his nose, he really didn't need this first thing in the morning. Okay, you, he pointed to the sword, speaking out loud for Tamari's benefit no manifesting unless there's a reason. And you, he pointed at Tamari, don't give him a reason. Tamari looked indignant and the sword was oozing smugness. Seeing as both apparently understood, Naruto continued. We're heading east as of now. We have no supplies and it's at least a day and a half to the nearest village. Tamari, you are to keep the sword on your back at all times, and must always be within 30 feet of me, otherwise, I'll have you restrained and carry you. Tamari suddenly had the feeling that the sword was leering at her, she managed to look furious and slightly embarrassed at the same time. Fine, she muttered, but I need something to tie my hair up with. Why? Naruto immediately asked. Two reasons, she said annoyedly, it falls in my face, making it hard to see and look stupid. Naruto pondered this for a moment, speaking as someone who has spent his life around whiny girls who spend all say on their appearance, your hair looks fine, and I'm the only one who can see it anyway. But if you're having trouble seeing, there's always the option of being carried. I'll be fine, she growled. They were soon moving through the forest at a fast pace, Tamari wondering the whole time whether the first part of the bastard's last comment had been a compliment or insult. The news that Naruto had been registered as a nuknin spread like wildfire through the leaf camp. It was quickly the most popular topic of gossip in camp, a great number of shinobi were already pushing to have a special squad of hunter nin devoted just to killing the fox boy. Tsunade had known this would happen, but she also knew she couldn't allow her personal feelings to get in the way of what had to be done. She felt a presence behind her and turned to see Umino Iruka standing nervously by the door of her tent. She gestured for him to enter, and he did, bowing quickly. Hokage-sama, I've been hearing some, the brown-haired Chonin paused, unsettling rumors around camp and wanted to confirm them with you. Is it true that you registered Naruto as a missing nin? Tsunade nodded, it now appears that he faked his own death to cover his, betrayal she finished sadly. Iruka looked at the ground sadly, in that case, Hokage-sama, there's something I'd like to give you. I want you to seriously consider it, please. He handed her a piece of paper before running out of the tent. Tsunade looked at what he had given her and her eyes widened. It was an application to join the hunter Nin. Chapter 11, Not Quite Checkmate. Once again, 
Naruto found himself in a rather difficult situation. They had made decent time and were now only an hour or two away from a small town on the border of Sound Country. Tamari had been, thankfully quiet for the latest part of their journey, as Naruto needed to come up with some way to control her within the town. Glowing red arms grabbing onto people was the kind of attention he didn't want, so he would have to be subtler in populated areas. He knew that constant physical contact was out of the question, they both needed clean clothing and a bath. His answer came in form of an image from Kyuubi. Naruto knew the sand girl wouldn't like it, but that was probably why the demon had suggested it. He held up a hand and the two shinobi stopped, landing on the ground almost in unison. Tamari turned to him with a glare, as he noted she always seemed to do. This meant she was at least less afraid of him now, though whether that was good or bad he couldn't decide. Why are we stopping so close to a village? The irate girl demanded to know. As I'm sure you know, Naruto said, it will be more difficult to watch you once we're in town. Tamari had known that for days, she was counting on it and would be looking for a chance to escape. And you also know, he continued, that my normal methods of restraining you won't work. So, with help from Sere Kirite, I have come up with a solution. Naruto walked over to the girl, took the sword of her back and with a flick of a kunai, cut a small hole in her clothes right above her waist. She of course, had something to say about this, what the hell do you think you're doing? Naruto grabbed her arm and calmly replaced the sword on her back, covering the hole. This way, he said, if you cause problems, the manifested restraints can go under your clothing. At this point, Naruto wasn't sure if she was red from embarrassment or anger. There is, of course, another option, but I didn't think you'd go for having to hold my hand 24-7. And if you don't try to run or kill me, it won't be a problem either way. The unfortunate thing was that she had been planning on trying to escape or kill him, or more likely both. Tamari knew she had lost this battle, but she was determined to win the war. He would have to slip up eventually, she would be there when he did. The two shinobi jumped back into the trees and went on their way. They arrived in town rather late, so Naruto led his rebellious but tired prisoner to one of the first good hotels he saw. He could afford it, and they had been sleeping on the ground for two nights. He got a regular two-bed room and quickly dragged Tamari upstairs. Their odd appearance and gigantic sword had been drawing attention. Once inside, Naruto set down some rules. Okay, you're leaving this room requires one of two things, either you're with me, or you've told me where you're going and you take Sere Kirite. Tamari got annoyed, this place had public baths, or am I supposed to just not wash myself? Naruto did a few hand seals. One cloud of smoke later, he was a dark-haired girl. He had modified his usual sexy no jutsu to include clothes. He grinned. Me or the sword, your pick. Tamari had a choice between an annoying boy and a creepy sword. The sword didn't talk. She took Sere Kirite. Tamari slid into the water still holding onto the sword. The bathing area was empty and she didn't want to give the blade any chance to restrain her while she was unclothed. Once she was settled, she held the sword up out of the water. She had never actually spent much time looking at it before. The handle was ordinary, but that was where normalcy ended. The blade reflected almost no light at all, no matter how she angled it. She moved on to the etching. It amazed her even now, both sides were carved in a mirror image of each other. The carving was perfect, the two great monsters locked in combat truly looked alive. She started at the hilt, where the fox's tail started, and slowly ran her hand across the engraved image. Near the middle of the blade, the fox and dragon twisted around each other, both trying to land a fatal blow. The scene was obviously near the end of a battle, but Tamari realized with a start that no one would ever know which one won the fight. The two would be forever frozen in the moment right before the victor was decided. Tamari realized that she had never asked how or why the sword was sentient, she just accepted it. After all, her little brother carried intelligent sand around with him, so who was she to question an intelligent sword? But now she was curious. She sank deeper into the warm water and decided to ask him about it later. Back in the room, Naruto was smacking himself in the head. Naruto had been working over a map, planning their route to and through Lightning Country when the Kyuubi had decided it would be fun to send random pictures of a wet Tamari directly into Naruto's mind every few seconds. The demon was careful to make sure each image was at an angle such that it suggested everything and revealed nothing. Kyuubi grinned to himself within the sword. This was fun. He had never had the chance to do things like this before and it was a novel experience. Hell, he though as Naruto started banging his head on the table, terrorizing these two was almost as much fun as obliterating a village. Almost. Tamari arrived back at their room an hour later, wrapped in a towel and carrying her clothes. 
Naruto didn't even glance up from where he was laying on his bed, he knew he would blush if he did. Tamari washed her clothes in the bathroom, as Naruto had done while she was bathing. She had spent enough time with her captor to know something weird was going on when he was quiet for this long. She estimated that he should have made at least three wisecracks by now. She emerged from the bathroom a short time later still wrapped in her towel, but Naruto could see as he glanced over that she was wearing her net shirt under it. Unlike the fox boy, she crawled under the covers of her bed. Tamari stared at the ceiling for a few moments, but quickly found herself drifting off. She was awakened some time later, but a silent glance at the clock showed it to be only 2 a.m. A lamp was on in the room, and a moment later Tamari noticed Naruto sitting at the table in the corner. Sarei Kirite was leaning against the other side of the table and Naruto was studying something on top. Are you aware it's 2 o'clock in the morning? Tamari half murmured. Yeah. Tamari glanced at what he was studying on the table. Why are you playing chess with yourself? She asked. I'm not came Naruto's reply. Who are you playing with then? Tamari asked skeptically, but as she finished speaking, a clawed hand reached out of the sword and moved a piece. Tamari blinked, your sword plays chess? Naruto nodded, he's pretty good at it too. Oh. Tamari paused for a moment, the question I'm leading up to here is why are you playing chess with your sword at 2 a.m.? Naruto took his opponent's knight with one of his bishops. Couldn't sleep. Tamari paused again, where did you get the chess set? QB took Naruto's rook with his queen. Stole it from the game room downstairs. Oh. Tamari just sat there for a moment. She slowly got out of bed and wrapped a blanket around herself before pulling a chair up to their table and silently watching them play. The boy felt himself drifting in pleasant darkness. There was nothing here, no one to bother him. Suddenly, he heard rather screechy voices surrounding him, and started to notice that his left arm hurt. Shikamaru opened his eyes and sighed. Troublesome. The moment Tsunade heard Shikamaru was awake, she insisted all others leave the room so she could debrief him personally. She sat next to his bed on a foldable chair. So you're absolutely sure the Hokage said, that it was a fox head that bit you? The shadow user nodded slowly, yes, a red fox head. It appeared to be a chakra manifestation. Tsunade was impressed, but Shikamaru was both the laziest and most observant person she knew, so if he said it had been a fox, it had been a fox. She knew what that meant. She slowly walked out of the room and turned to the waiting Shizun, Naruto's status is now upgraded, he is now an S-class missing nin. He was the one who attacked the northern gate. QB is active enough to manifest, I want the best hunter nin and onbu we have on this. The demon cannot be allowed to break loose. The great irony of course being that at that moment in time, the great demon fox was about as dangerous as a house cat without Naruto to give him chakra. Currently, Naruto was quite contentedly snoring in bed. Tamari had woken up first and was already dressed. She had momentarily considered making a break for the door, but Sarei Kirite's presence mocked her, as if daring her to run. She looked at the sword again and out of sheer curiosity, started to count the tails on the fox. She had known there were more than six, but never actually counted. Seven, eight, nine, nine tails, a nine-tailed fox something tickled in Tamari's memory, a connection she had missed and couldn't get a hold of. She looked around the room and saw Naruto's wallet sitting on the table. It was a frog. Her eyes widened. Gara. The girl pinned against the tree. Gara transformed. The frog. The fox. Uzumaki Naruto. He must have left his village only a short time after she last saw him, after the failed rescue of Uchiha Sasuke. Almost everything about him had changed, but she was sure it was him all the same. This was the boy who had beaten her brother the one who was supposed to be dead. Tamari suddenly thought of his new name. Fushichu Naruto. One who was burned alive and reborn from the ashes of his demise. Of all her revelations, it was this one that stayed with her as she watched him awake. Naruto knew something was wrong the moment he woke up. Tamari sitting on a chair near the end of his bed and was looking at him thoughtfully, she had never done that before. I want you to promise to answer a question truthfully, the sand girl said carefully. Sensing humor wouldn't be appreciated right now, Naruto just nodded. Tamari took a deep breath, how did Uzumaki Naruto really die? Of all the questions in the world, that had been the one Naruto had been least expecting, but it was at least, he thought sadly, one he knew the answer to. He died, the boy said with a dark smile, from broken dreams and a broken heart. The both sat in silence for a few minutes, then Naruto quietly got out of bed, put his vest and shoes on and slid Sarei Kirite into place on his back. 
he walked to the door of their room and stopped. Tamari stood up, put on her shoes, and they walked out the door together. Tamari would later wonder what might have happened had she not followed him that day. But, she would then amend, it hadn't really been her decision. In that moment, whatever fear or desire to escape she had was overcome by a need to understand. And so she followed. Iruka stared into the mirror and the white mask that stared back. The decision to don the mask had been easy. Iruka knew Naruto better than anyone, so no one would be a better choice for hunting the boy down. The problems would arise, he knew, when he did find the boy. What was he going to do, ask the boy to come back? As much as Iruka hated to admit it, Naruto had engineered and executed an almost perfect fake death, one that had fooled the whole village for weeks. The problem was, that kind of planning was proof that his leaving had been premeditated, and not just spontaneous. There was no leniency in the law when it came to that type of treason. A shinobi who left the village in a way that suggested it had been planned was to be killed on sight. Iruka didn't think he could live with that, he had to talk to Naruto first. The brown-haired man carefully removed his new mask and massaged his face. He would wait, and decide what to do when he saw Naruto. Gara wasn't sure what to think. The news that Tamari had disappeared in an attack by Naruto was both comforting and disturbing at the same time. Gara was sure Naruto wouldn't hurt his sister, but that really didn't make the thought of his sister being held captive by a Nuknin, even Naruto, more likable. Kankuro hadn't taken it nearly so well, and had gone to vent his anger on some trees. Gara stared up at the sky. He and Kankuro had been called back to hidden sand alone with the rest of the sand nins. They would leave the next day. The sand swirled around him anxiously, he hated to leave without Tamari, but she could be anywhere. He would have to trust Naruto to take care of her, and for the fox boy's sake, he better be trustworthy. Hiroshi ran through the forest, surrounded by a squad. The Hokage had deployed them ten hours before, she had mobilized more than half the hunter nin for this. Squads were sent to all nearby towns, told they were hunting an S-class criminal named Uzumaki. Everyone, of course, knew what that meant. The Demon Child. As an added bonus, Hiroshi had heard that he had taken a sand girl along with him. Hiroshi had lost his brother to the war with the sand and figured that if his squad found them, he might have to engineer a little accident involving the sand nin. Currently, the aforementioned sand's nin was shopping. It hadn't taken her 30 seconds after leaving the hotel to realize that the sword no longer covered the hole Naruto had made in her clothing. Naruto was now carrying his sword, as there wouldn't be any need to restrain her. They had come to a kind of unspoken understanding, she knew enough now that if she ran, he would probably be forced to hunt her down and kill her. She knew he really didn't want to do that, and she didn't really want to die. They both knew she wouldn't run. And so she was now looking for new clothes. Naruto had given her 15,000 yen to spend mostly, as she liked and had gone off to buy traveling supplies. Tamari had never been a shopping person, primarily because she always wore the same thing, but Naruto had insisted she get some pants and at least one regular shirt. She had growled for a little while, as she was very fond of her net shirts, but complied anyway. He was the one paying, after all. Naruto arrived back an hour later to see Tamari looking rather stressed, but holding a shopping bag of clothes. Naruto himself was carrying a large duffel. Once they arrived back at the room, Naruto opened the bag and started pulling out its contents one by one, naming them as he went. Some new pants to replace the pair I lost, two extra light sleeping bags, new underwear, magnetic chest set, whetstone, dehydrated soup, a pot, pocky, soap, oh and, he pulled out a small package and threw them to her with a smirk, new hair ties. Tamari glared, but it was half-hearted. Things were still slightly awkward between them. Tamari had accepted that trying to escape was pointless. Eventually, she knew Naruto would let her go, but it still felt somehow wrong to be acting like the two of them were just two shinobi on a mission, when she technically was his prisoner. Naruto was getting nervous, she was looking at him thoughtfully again. The boy got refocused when he thought of the plan he had made the evening before. He pulled out his map and laid it out on table. This, he said, pointing to a small dot on the eastern border on Sound Country, is where we are now. Naruto went on to describe the approximate location of Hidden Cloud and the path they would have to travel to get there, but it was the end of his speech that made Tamari jump. And when we arrive, I'm going to let you go. The boy finished, my village will figure out my secret soon anyway, and the cloud has no hostilities with the sand, so you should be able to find your way home. Things didn't seem so bad all of a sudden, Tamari now had a goal to work towards. It would be a week at least to Hidden Cloud, but it meant that she could be home in the sand within the month. Tamari would have liked to leave that moment, but
but Naruto wanted to take a bath himself, which he had neglected to do the day before, and eat a meal in town, as it would be two days to the next one. The two paid the hotel manager and left right after diner. Tamari got to carry the duffel since Naruto had his sword to haul around, but she complained about it regularly, just to annoy him. The Nuknin and his prisoner were almost to the edge of town when they passed a small sushi shop. Above them on the roof, Hiroshi smiled as he looked at the picture in his hand. It was his lucky day. Naruto felt his shinobi sense tingling as soon as he passed the sushi shop, so it was with relative calmness that he shoved Tamari into an alley, drew his sword and spun to deflect some needles aimed at his neck in one smooth motion. There were six hunters that he could see, and there would be one spotter somewhere. Naruto ran down the street, staying close to the buildings. Even hunters couldn't throw jutsus around in populated areas. He leapt into the air and spun, releasing Sere Kirite, before landing and running along a building wall while flashing through seals. The hunters scattered as the huge sword sailed past them, but failed to notice when it split into nine. Naruto jumped off the wall, landing on the ground just in time to catch his sword and go into a spinning slice, dispatching a hunter who had tried get into close combat. A second hunter came at him from behind, while the other three tried to hit a vital point with their needles. Naruto snorted, these weaklings had nothing on Haku. He spun again, deflecting the needles with the flat of the blade and bringing it around to face the hunter who had tried to attack his rear. Sere Kirite flashed again, the second hunter fell. Apart from a few needles in uncomfortable places, Naruto was uninjured. Three hunters faced him in the street, deciding how they should attack. He never gave them a chance. He let his body flow into the death stance and watched them freeze up in terror. They would be able to fight it off in a few seconds. QB didn't need half that much time. The sword shadow clones came from behind, as they had with Kuji. Without the added bulk of multi-size no jutsu, none of them stood a chance. Various pieces of hunter nin lay in the street, but Naruto wasn't paying attention. There had been six. Where was the last one? He spun with a growl and ran back towards the alley. To say that Tamari was shocked would be an understatement. She sat in the darkness between the two buildings with mixed feelings. She knew the presence of the hunter nin meant she was safe and could go home but there was a part of her that would mourn the death of the odd boy she had spent four days with. A leaf hunter nin landed in front of her and offered her a hand getting up. She smiled sadly as she reached for it, but then noticed a glint in his other hand. Her eyes widened, the hunter was concealing a knife and slowly drawing the arm back for a stab. It's a common misconception that in the game of chess, a player wins when he kills the opponent's king. In reality, a player wins when his opponent's king is put in such a position where, no matter what he does, he dies. Tamari had one more move. Naruto arrived just in time to see Tamari trip the final hunter and slam a kunai into his face. The mask split, revealing the man's face just long enough for him to whisper, sand bitch and fall, blood oozing around the knife sticking out of his forehead. Naruto rushed to catch Tamari as she collapsed. She had just killed a leaf hunter, one sent to kill a nuknin she was traveling with. Right now the spotter for the squad was rushing back to inform his superiors of what happened. Within 24 hours, she would be labeled as a missing nin. Hours ago she had been looking forward to seeing her village in under a month. She would probably never see her village again. But she was alive. There was nothing Naruto could say, so he just sat, soaked in blood, and held her as she sobbed. Chapter 12, Culinary Philosophy Tamari sat up against a tree, her arms wrapped around her legs and her eyes staring off into space. Naruto was starting a fire to cook a dehydrated rice dish he had picked up. Both were in an odd state. They had been running for 16 hours, and had been up for more than 24. Despite that, neither felt like sleeping. After finally getting the fire started, Naruto walked over and sat against the tree next to Tamari. He grabbed a stick of Paki out of the package he kept in one of his shuriken holsters and started to slowly munch. Did you know, he asked the girl, that I once ate fried rice made by the third Hokage? Tamari was silent. I've since then discovered, he continued, that much of a person's personality is defined by the food they eat. The third liked fried rice, which is basically made up of things that are healthy, but is fried in oil to make it just a little bit sinful. Tamari turned to look at him slightly as he went on. Iruka, who you don't know, always ate ramen with me at a stand. Ramen is cheap, warm and filling. Iruka was always like that, never wanting anything in return for the kindness he showed everyone. Tamari now had most of her attention focused on Naruto's words. Then, Naruto held up his snack, we have Paki, an inherent contradiction. A pretzel stick, covered in chocolate. These two sides make it almost impossible to define, 
it is neither good nor bad for you, neither sweet nor salty, it is ambiguous, it just is. Naruto took another bite, the first person I ate Paki with was a psychopath who murdered his family. He was also the person who taught me the skills that saved both our lives. These two sides seem impossible to reconcile, until you stop thinking in terms of good and evil. Naruto finished his stick and grabbed another, yesterday, I killed five people from my old village in less than 60 seconds, but I needed to do it for us to survive. I don't think of myself as good or evil. I, like Paki, just continue to exist. Naruto took his Paki out of his holster and set it on the ground before standing up and going over to check on the fire. Tamari slowly reached and took a stick out of the open pack. She set her head on her knees as she took a bite, smiling ever so slightly. Tsunade was tense. The camp was being packed and the shinobi were getting ready to head back to Konoha, and this meant making arrangements for all the wounded, making sure they had a way to get home. Shizun rushed up to her, Hokage-sama, we have another problem with Yamanaka Ino. Tsunade sighed, what this time? She was disturbing the other patients again. So? She does that constantly. She was explaining to another patient how horrible it was to try and find anything that looked fashionable in a wheelchair. And? The patient she was explaining this to had his face horribly scarred and both his eyes burned out by a fire jutsu, he apparently had a small mental breakdown after listening to her for 20 minutes. Tsunade swore, have a chonin watch her constantly, that girl has less tact than Jiraiya in a bathhouse. Shizun rushed off just as another shinobi rushed up carrying a scroll, which Tsunade snatched and started to read. Her face went white as a sheet. Gara and Konkuro were just preparing to leave when a leaf chonin ran up to them and whispered something in Gara's ear. Our sister's been what? Gara bellowed, causing every breathing being within 60 feet to freeze. Gara was really fighting the urge to squish someone right now. He stormed through the camp, his sand spinning around him, picking up random things and flinging them around. He looked rather like a sand tornado. His storm was normally limited to picking up non-living things. Tents, chairs, packed boxes of this or that, but it also picked up the odd shinobi or small child, and most were rather displeased with being flung in random directions. He figured the Hokage would get complaints later, but really didn't care. Surprisingly, Konkuro was also fighting the urge to squish someone. He almost started setting off poison bombs the moment Gara had told him. Though not as impressive as his younger brother, Konkuro was pissed as hell, and was following in Gara's wake. Tsunade suddenly found herself exposed as a walking sandstorm disintegrated her tent. Can I help you? The Hokage asked politely. Instead of squishing her, he settled for his most menacing glare. Why has my sister been registered as a missing nin? Tsunade was getting nervous, she was reported to have killed one of the hunter nin sent to find Naruto, the whole squad less one was wiped out. Gara continued to glare, and therefore, the last member must be the one who told you these lies about Tamari. Tsunade was starting to squirm, until I learn otherwise, I have to assume he's telling the truth. The sand started to swirl more violently and Konkuro stepped forward to back his little brother up if he needed it. Kakashi calmly walked between the Hokage and the demon boy, reading his porn book and laughing to himself, completely immune to the tension. The eyes of over 60 onlookers watched the copy ninja as he wandered off again, completely ignorant. Gara growled, Kakashi had killed the mood. He spun on his heels, calling over his shoulder, no sand hunters will pursue her, I will see to that. If you want to throw away the lives of your shinobi, Gara grinned, feel free. The sand user stomped away, wishing he was half as confident as he sounded. Tamari didn't even have her fan, which meant she'd be mostly useless in any difficult fight. He was hoping his confidence might have thrown the Hokage off for a little while, but knew that even if his ploy worked, it wouldn't for long. Soon she would deploy the hunter nin again. Gara had limited power, but he could stop the sand hunters and he could, and would, make the Hokage's life as difficult as possible. He needed to talk to Baki. The Hokage had sent the hunter's report to Iruka before she sent the messenger to Gara and now strode purposefully into his tent to see what he thought. She then strode purposefully back out, blushing slightly, as she had walked in on him changing. A minute later, Iruka blushingly invited her in, but things soon turned serious. Hokage-sama, the Chonin began, before anything else, you must first promise that you will not send any other hunter squads to be slaughtered without consulting me. Tsunade raised an eyebrow at his presumptuousness, but nodded. We have unfortunately, Iruka continued, put Naruto in his most dangerous state. In taking the sand girl, he took responsibility for her, and now that she's been declared a missing nin, Naruto will blame himself for that too. 
that unfortunately means that Naruto will do anything to keep her alive. He isn't desperate, but he is ruthless, and no ordinary squad can fight him with any decent hope of victory. Tsunade let the Chonin continue as he shifted gears. The first thing we have to do is clear up some misconceptions, Naruto is incredibly clever, and we can't underestimate him. From the report I read, he killed the hunter nin primarily with taijutsu, and very quickly, so we have no idea what types of ninjutsu he's picked up in his time away. Another point is Naruto's sword, where did he get it? What does it do? The report talked about the sword splitting into many and acting independently, as if they were controlled. That has to be looked into. Tsunade just stood there as Iruka continued to talk. Next, the idea that QB is breaking the seal is absurd, if the demon is manifesting, it's to help Naruto fight, but we need to confirm that too, it sounds unlikely. As for the boy's changed appearance, Iruka glanced at the report again, I'll explain that later. Right now, I need you to gather these people, this is the team I'll need. Tsunade ran her eyes down the list and looked slightly shocked. But, this is. Iruka nodded, when we go after Naruto, we need those people, otherwise, it's useless. He dispatched five chonin with only taijutsu. That skill, combined with the mist jutsu he used in the attack on the north gate, would allow him to fight even a jounin squad, but I can counter it if you give me the right team. Tsunade turned to leave, but Iruka had one more thing to say, oh, and Hokage-sama, I'll need the shinobi ID photos for Gara and Sasuke copied onto clear plastic. Call me when everything is ready. Tsunade glared slightly, you better have one hell of a presentation for us, Iruka. He looked at the ground sadly, oh, I will. Be sure of that. Naruto and Tamari sat around their fire eating breakfast. Thankfully, both had been able to sleep the night before and were now not quite so tired. Naruto was currently trying to convince Tamari that her life wasn't over, and unfortunately for her village loyalty, he was winning the argument. I mean really, the fox boy was saying, how many people in your old village were even decent to you? From what I hear, your life has been training and taking crap from the villagers. Tamari didn't say anything since the only comeback she had come up with was that she kind of liked training. I realize that you miss your family, he continued, but I really can't see either of your brothers condemning you for this, and who cares what the rest of the village thinks. Tamari was being swayed by his argument, but suddenly glared. There is, she said, the minor issue of spending your life being hunted. Naruto shrugged, Gara scares the hidden sand way too much for them to hunt you, and as for hidden leaf, they'll give up sooner or later. Sensing she was bending, Naruto went on. Can you even remember the last time you did something fun? And I mean fun in a not killing people kind of way. I understand that you didn't ask for this, but there are many worse fates. Tamari snorted, like what? Naruto smiled, having a demon inside you. Tamari stopped and looked at him for a moment, I really can't argue with that, can I? His smile became a grin, no. She sighed, but even if I went along with being a missing nin, I'd need a new fan. Battle fans are only made in hidden sand, and even then, not many are manufactured. This, Naruto realized, would be a problem. But he had ways of dealing with problems. Wait a second, he said, I need to consult with someone. Naruto let himself drop into a meditative state and soon found himself in the passages of his mind, the chibi fox already waiting for him. The fox looked absolutely ecstatic, and Naruto wasn't sure if this was good or bad. QB got straight to the point, I have a sand battle fan, a very nice one too. But, of course, Naruto said, you want something in exchange. What? Naturally, the demon said, I want a greater chakra allowance. Tripled. Naruto looked at the demon carefully. Tripling his allowance would give the demon access to a quarter of his chakra. Deal, the boy said, how do we get this fan of yours? We need to summon a gate to my storage area, it's a relatively simple jutsu, it just requires a lot of chakra. And there's one other problem. That being. I need to be the one to do the jutsu, QB said. Naruto looked at the demon suspiciously, why? The jutsu cuts through space, and the user has to know the correct seals, the address, so to speak, of wherever they're going. I'm not giving you a free pass to raid my ancient collection of treasures whenever you want. If you want the fan, I do the jutsu. Just stick the sword in any vertical surface, walk through the gate, grab the fan, walk out. Fine, Naruto agreed, but if I get the slightest feeling of being tricked. Naruto let the threat hang in the air and let himself come back out to the real world, where Tamari was looking at him oddly. I was talking with my sword, he has a way to get a fan for you, Naruto said as an explanation. 
He walked through the forest, looking for a suitable surface while Tamari asked a question. So who is it in that sword, anyway? Some shinobi that was caught on the wrong of a sealing jutsu or something? Naruto shook his head, still looking for a vertical surface, nah, greater demon, more specifically, the Nine Tails Demon Fox. Tamari had stopped moving about three seconds before. The QB no Kitsune is in your sword. Naruto looked at her oddly, yeah, it used to be in my stomach, but a forbidden jutsu used in the forging of my sword changed that. Why? Actually, Tamari really couldn't think of a reason why. It just seemed like having a greater demon in your sword was something to make a big deal about. So let me get this straight, the demon fox has a fan I can use? Naruto shook his head, you can have it, I'm giving him more chakra in exchange. And where exactly is this fan? Tamari asked skeptically. Naruto held out a hand to silence her as he found what he needed, a large rock had broken in half, leaving a flat surface. He slammed Sarei Kirite into the rock and watched as it started to glow, then the sword sank into the rock as a black doorway appeared. Tamari's jaw hung slack as Naruto calmly walked in. He found himself in what appeared to be nothing more than a large room with white walls. It was filled with, well, everything. Stuff was everywhere, but Naruto figured a huge fan couldn't be hard to find, and he was proven right a short time later as he hauled it out from under a pile of scrolls and what looked like a gold statue of an unnamed shinobi. Tamari continued to stand frozen as Naruto emerged from the door a few minutes later, carrying a large fan. He turned as the door closed behind him and Sarei Kirite appeared to grow out of the blackness until the door was gone and the sword was exactly where Naruto had slammed it. He pulled his blade from the rock, replacing it on his back and handed the fan to Tamari. It's amazing, he said, how useful a demon can be sometimes. Tamari wasn't listening. She was in awe of what he had just handed to her. Tamari had always used a basic battle fan, she had been using it for years, but had never been given a new one and had never complained. What she held now was a master's fan. The frame was dark metal, and the fan was a good foot longer than her old one. Nothing appeared much different on the outside, but Tamari knew, when she opened it. With a subtle motion, the fan snapped open, and even Naruto took a momentary break from his babbling to admire it. The fan was painted to look like a sunset, and no inch of it was left uncolored. It was filled with reds and purples and pinks that made it look like the real thing. Tamari hadn't known what the pattern painted on would be, but all master fans were painted to look like they lit the air itself on fire when swung. It was the most amazing thing she had ever seen. After his moment of admiration, Naruto went back to his ponderings about the many uses of having a demon. It was for that reason that, moments later, his brain shut down. His eyes told him Tamari wasn't where she had been standing a moment ago. His ears only heard breathing. His nose smelled soap. His sense of taste wasn't receiving anything, but that was more than made up for by touch. Naruto wasn't someone experienced with full body contact, and never with a girl. But that was most definitely what was happening now. He unconsciously noted that in addition to all the previously mentioned things, he couldn't move. In other words, Tamari was giving him a hug. Chapter 13, Dastardly Plotting Tamari sat in the forest with her new fan in her lap, laughing hysterically. Naruto looked over from where he was cooking supper and raised an eyebrow. What's so funny, exactly? The boy asked. Tamari tried to control herself, in our village, giggle, there's always been the legend that wind masters could ignite the air. I always thought, snicker, that it was because their fans were painted to look like it. She started to laugh again and held up her fan for him to see, on the inside of the frame were carved words, starting with the kanji for kaze nenshao no justu. The burning winds technique. Tamari looked at Naruto, there are only three fans like this in all of hidden sand, and they never make more. There are over 40 wind users who are in level and only three of them know the jutsu I just read over. I've spent nine years training with my battle fan, 300 swings a day, and learned a few low and mid-level skills. In the first week I spend with you, I find what's probably among the most powerful wind jutsus in existence. After saying it, Tamari wasn't sure what she thought of this new revelation. Naruto, however, just shrugged. So? My strength has at least doubled in the couple months it's been since I left Konoha, it's to be expected of missing nins. Seeing Tamari's curiosity, he elaborated. The idea of a hidden village is that it teaches a certain set of skills, which it keeps secret. For example, mist jutsus aren't taught in hidden leaf and fire jutsus are rarely taught in hidden mist. This means that people are very limited in what they learn. Nuke nins, on the other hand, have no such restrictions. He continued on, checking the food as he did so. The sword I use is a mist sword, 
no one in Leaf uses such weapons, but I do because it suits me. I know that you love your fan, but I can and intend to teach you every jutsu I know. It's a sharing of resources, and it's what makes missing Nin so strong. Tamari nodded, though the idea of learning foreign jutsu sounded odd to her, it made a lot of sense. Seeing the food was cooked, Naruto took it off the fire and sat down next to Tamari's fan. His own words had given him an idea. How long, he asked, will it take you to learn that fire jutsu written on your fan? Tamari thought for a moment, assuming we spend most of each day traveling, about a week to be good enough to use it, but completely mastering a jutsu like this takes years. Naruto started digging through scroll pouches on his vest, he finally found what he was looking for and passed it to her. It was the scroll of basic stealth jutsus from Hidden Mist the old barber had given him. I want you, he said, to learn the first jutsu in that scroll, Mizu Jushuku no Jutsu, water condensation technique, it's a basic jutsu used to help people learn Kirigakura no Jutsu. It supersaturates the air around you with water, like on a very humid day. And why, Tamari asked, am I doing this? Naruto started to eat and spoke between bites, I have an idea, but I won't say anything else until I see this burning winds technique of yours. More importantly, if we move at a steady pace, I expect the next hunter squad to catch up to us in just under two weeks, I want to be ready for them when they appear. Naruto took a bite of rice and chewed for a minute, they won't make the same mistakes as last time, they'll be far better prepared, and there'll probably be more of them. All this means that not only will I need your help this time, we need to plan in advance. Tamari set down her fan and grabbed some food for herself, and the two spent the evening talking. By the time Tamari slid her fan into her sleeping bag and crawled in next to it, her mind was a whirlwind of activity. She had just decided to help ambush a group of Leaf Nin, allies of her country. Her status as a Nuke Nin would be unquestionable after this. Somehow, that thought didn't bother her nearly so much as it should have. As the Leaf Army set up camp for the night, Tsunade sent a messenger to Iruka. She had finally arranged for the transfer of everyone he needed. She had temporarily transferred seven shinobi to the hunter Nin and their first group briefing was to start in ten minutes. When said time arrived, Iruka strode into a tent of mostly confused-looking faces. Iruka quickly took control. Everyone, shut up. He called, silencing the group. As some of you know, he continued, you are here because you have been temporarily put under my command for a very important mission. That is to find and incapacitate Uzumaki Naruto by any means necessary. Iruka saw a couple people gasp slightly and went on, I want each of you to tell me, now, why you've been selected for this team. You need to understand that before anything else, go from right to left. The person on Iruka's far right stood. I am here, Morino Aviki said, because I am the best personality analyzer in Konoha. My purpose is to study the target's movements and figure out what he'll do next. Iruka had done some digging and discovered that Aviki had played a similar role in the hunt for Uchiha Itachi. Iviki sat and the second person stood, I am here, said Hayuga Neji, to act as a scout for the squad. Iruka was pleased with that answer, he had been afraid the Hayuga might start into a speech about destiny. The third member stood, as troublesome as it is, I am here to strategize, and because I'm the only one to see Naruto's powers of manifestation. Shikamaru added a grumble for added effect. Number four stood, I guess I'm here because I'm somewhat, experienced with the habits of S-class criminals. Anko smirked as she finished. The fifth member just looked lost, so Iruka stepped in. Kenten is here, he said, because she is by far the most experienced with weapons, and as of now, we know nothing about the sword Naruto carries or how to counter it. The sixth member stood and casually put his book away, I guess I'm here because Naruto was on my team, so I know him pretty well, and of course, because I'm a Jounin. All the Genin and Chonin glared. Kakashi just smiled under his mask. The seventh member stood looking only slightly nervous, Tsunade Sama has sent me to act as the squad's medic and her representative. Shizun quickly sat back down. Iruka surveyed his team. He hadn't asked for Shizun, but knew she would be a good addition. First thing, Iruka looked pointedly at Kakashi, I don't care what your rank is, you're under my command until the Hokage says otherwise. He got a round of nods. Good, now on to the briefing. Iruka had decided to start off with a demonstration so he took the photos of Gara and Sasuke the Hokage it had transferred to clear plastic and overlapped them. We are looking, he said as he held the overlaid pictures up to the light, for someone of almost exactly this hair color. Iviki nodded slowly, but the rest had wide eyes. Iruka set the pictures down and turned to his team. Right now, Naruto is changing, and so he looks to what he admires to see how he should change. 
It's a period all missing Nin go through, redefining their identity, but it doesn't last forever. If we are ever going to catch him, we need to do it now, while he is relatively predictable. Iruka started to pace as he talked, but there are complications, not the least of which is Tamari of the Sand. Initially, she was his prisoner, but we have a report stating she killed one of the hunter Nin last sent after them, so we have no idea what to expect from her. As time passed, Iruka called various team members up to explain certain things. Iviki gave a speech on the possibility that Naruto was using the accumulation of fear stimulus, which most of the team members had never heard of before. Kenten was asked to talk about the various methods Naruto could be using to control his swords, and Anko talked about making sure they didn't allow themselves to go easy on him because he had once been their friend. She calmly explained that they would have enough problems beating him going all out, never mind if one of them got cold feet. At the end of four long hours, Iruka let them go off to bed, as they were leaving for Konoha early the next morning. Most left feeling they had accomplished a great deal, but they all knew they were short on information. All they could do now was speculate based on the words of a single hunter Nin. Once the tent was cleared, Iruka sat alone and rubbed his head. He couldn't believe he was doing this, but also knew it needed to be done. This was the best shot they would ever have, they knew approximately where the boy was, and what he was doing. More importantly, they had an idea of who he was. A year from now, Naruto could be a completely different person. Iruka knew he was the only one who could do this, not even Kakashi understood Uzumaki Naruto the way he did. He couldn't allow himself to fail. Gara, Konkuro, and Baki sat in their tent, facing each other somberly. Konkuro smirked at his Jounin teacher, Go fish. Baki cursed silently, he had been sure Konkuro had a two. He drew the four of clubs and re-examined his hand. It wasn't looking good. Baki decided to gamble, Gara, do you have any fours? The red-haired boy glared as he handed his four of diamonds over. The three were now relaxing with a game of go fish after hours of dastardly plotting. They knew the worst they could do was slow the hunt, but they intended to do that as much as possible. The first act had already been done, as Gara had used his sand to steal all the hunter nin masks in camp and had hidden them in a bag. He then found a hornet's nest in a tree in the forest and used the bag to block it. Whoever removed the bag would get a rather unwelcome surprise. Naruto woke up the next morning with a sense of purpose. They were only three hours from a small city, and he decided they would spend the day there. He figured that the two of them needed some time to enjoy themselves. They had made excellent time over the last couple days and were ahead of schedule, and Naruto also didn't want to get too far ahead of the hunters. That may have sounded odd, but his plan required that he know when the hunter nins were coming, and if they initially escaped and the hunters couldn't find them, who knew when the masked shinobi would find them again. Naruto started to pack up camp just as Tamari was waking up. As had become their custom, Naruto turned his back as she got out of her sleeping bag, and after 15 seconds or so, went back to whatever he had been doing. The two were soon running and arrived at the edge of the city at around 11 o'clock. The first order of business was, as always, to find a place to stay. Tamari suggested a tall hotel so they could practice on the roof without being seen from the ground. Naruto agreed and soon they had a room. They both quickly retreated to the roof where Tamari was practicing Mizu Joshoku no Jutsu while Naruto counted their money. They were still well off, but the money would run out just before or as they arrived at Hidden Cloud, so they would have to find work quickly. Meanwhile, Tamari was having some problems with her practicing. She managed to gather water into the air around her, but it took a long time. She clocked herself at about 30 seconds to complete the Jutsu. The other problem was that her cloths were soaked through, and she would swear Sarei Kirite was leering at her. She would be just starting the jutsu, and she would have this incredibly creepy feeling run down her spine, but when she turned, the sword was just sitting there on the roof next to Naruto, same as always. Inside the sword, Kyuubi was grinning to himself. He had noticed that he had become more easily amused after 14 years of imprisonment, but didn't really mind. Every time Tamari turned her back, the demon would manifest just a little bit of his head, enough to stare at her until she started to turn and the demon dropped the manifestation. This went on for 20 minutes or so until Naruto noticed, immediately telling the fox to give it a rest, as Tamari was starting to look mentally unstable. Finished with his monetary evaluation, Naruto stood and stretched. You up for a taijutsu spar? The boy asked the still irate San Nin. Tamari nodded abruptly and brought her fan into the ready position, Naruto looked at it nervously. You do realize, he said, that taijutsu means no wind blasts, I seriously doubt the hotel would appreciate a hole in its roof. Tamari didn't even bother to respond, she just ran, swinging low, 
trying to take Naruto's legs out from under him. Naruto decided to experiment, he blocked the fan with his sword and sent an image to Kyuubi. Tamari expected her attack to be blocked, but didn't expect the counterattack to come of the form of a manifested glowing claw. She flung herself backwards, just dogging the demon swipe. The spar continued mostly like that. The sand girl found herself often able to block Sarei Kirite if she saw it coming, but the demon and Naruto were working together in synchronization. Kyuubi could manifest from anywhere on the sword at any time, making him completely unpredictable. The final experiment came when Naruto threw his blade, which Tamari just managed to dodge, only to find herself flying through the air. Kyuubi had manifested from the flying blade and grabbed her ankle. Since letting go meant dropping her, Kyuubi just flew around in a full circle, releasing Tamari so she fell into Naruto, causing both nins to go sprawling. They tried to untangle themselves while Sarei Kirite embedded itself in the roof, oozing self-satisfaction. Both deciding that was enough sparing for the day, and as it was around noon, the two went back to their room and started to think about lunch. To Tamari's mild shock, Naruto changed into one of his t-shirts, and even more odd was that he left his sword in the room and told her to do the same with her fan. I really don't like the idea of walking around unarmed, I just got the fan a couple days ago and I'm still getting used to it. Naruto waved off her concerns, Sarei Kirite will watch the room and make sure nothing happens to your fan. We, he said with a grin, are going out. At this point, Tamari demonstrated the art of appearing embarrassed and angry at the same time. It's a subtle combination of a light blush and narrowed eyes. Naruto figured she was about to ask why, so he just grabbed her hand and walked out of the room. Three minutes later, the two were walking down the street, Tamari's complaints and questions forgotten. So, where are we going, exactly? She asked curiously. It's a surprise. I don't like surprises, tell me. Naruto stopped walking and turned to examine her for a moment. Without warning, he closed the distance between them wrapping his arms around her neck. A moment of fiddling later, he pulled off her forehead protector and slid it into his pocket with a grin. Tamari remained frozen for a few seconds longer, then glared, but noticed he wasn't wearing his own either. Naruto shrugged, we won't need to be shinobi today, so there's no need to advertise that we are shinobi. Tamari continued to glare, next time, tell me. I'll do it. Naruto shrugged again, okay, but he was still grinning. Tamari didn't realize she had forgotten to ask where they were going until they arrived. Back in their hotel room, the maid was vacuuming the floor when she suddenly jumped and screamed. There was no one in the room but she would swear someone had just pinched her. Elsewhere, the Konoha camp was chaos. No less than seven incidents had occurred since this morning, and Tsunade was starting to get significantly annoyed. It had all started when two hunter nin had come to her reporting that their masks were missing, it was soon noticed that all the masks were missing. An hour of searching later, a squad covered in wasp stings fell at her feet, holding the bag of masks. Since then, a group of people had gotten sick from food poisoning, a group of genin had gotten lost in the forest, numerous shinobi had found small stinging animals in their shoes, and Ino had somehow escaped her guard and had traumatized three patients in the hospital with her incessant whining. The Hokage was sure all these events had something to do with the three all too innocent looking sand shinobi in front of her, but had no proof. Gara, Konkuro, and Baki stood there smiling warmly showing no trace of malice. Tsunade had called the three here to discuss Baki's request for the squad to remain in Konoha to monitor events concerning Tamari. She knew the three were just going to disrupt the hunt, but couldn't say that for political reasons. She was about to make up a reason to deny Baki's request when she noticed water on the ground and a chonin burst into the room. Hokage-sama. You won't believe this. Come look outside. Sensing the urgency, Tsunade rushed out of the tent and gasped. The whole camp was covered in eight inches of water, which was very quickly turning the field into a swamp. The three sand nins were no less surprised than the Hokage at his sight before them, this hadn't been one of their many plots, none of them had the power to do this. Anbu suddenly dropped around them, the leader quickly kneeled in the mud and gave his report. It's some type of unknown water jutsu that brings water from underground rivers and springs to the surface. We sensed a large chakra signature, but when we arrived at its location the jutsu was done and there was no trace of the user. We did however, find this. The Anbu commander handed Tsunade a sealed note, which she opened. Dear Hokage. Just a note to inform you that your security is a little lax, I've been here for five hours and no one's noticed me. I was hoping for a decent fight, but in lieu of that, I've left you a present to remind you to be more observant. I hope your robes and scrolls kept are in a water-resistant bag. Itachi. In the margin was a drawing of a cloaked figure giving peace sign. 
Tsunade swore and crumpled the note in her hand. She looked out at the mess that had been an organized military camp only hours earlier. It might be one or two days before the main force could move out again, they'd have to find the nearest river and camp there, as almost everything would need to be washed. One man had just set an army back two to three days. Tsunade sighed, I know it's hopeless, but search the area just in case Itachi decided to hang around, other than that, everyone salvage what they can from the mud. Deciding that her declaration applied to them too, the three sand snuck out the other way. Gara made a note to find and learn that water jutsu. Tamari walked excitedly through the street fair, looking at everything. Open shops and stands really didn't work in hidden sand, as windstorms were too violent. Naruto just followed her slowly, as she rushed from one stall to the next, oblivious to the afternoon's heat. Naruto had always enjoyed places like this, but had only ever worked up the nerve to go to a festival in Konoha once. It had been the best night of his life until someone had recognized him and a small riot started. Thankfully, there was no riot this time, just an overenthusiastic girl. Tamari stopped for a moment to stare covetously at the merchandise of an old lady selling intricate fans. They were of normal size, but beautiful all the same. Her attention was soon diverted, however, when she saw a stand selling mini donuts. Realizing she had no money, she looked for Naruto. Said boy was walking down the center of the walkway when Tamari rushed up to him. I need money for mini donuts. Why? Because I've never had mini donuts before, Tamari said, as if it were obvious. Naruto sighed and handed over his wallet, you can spend 3,000 yen, no more. Tamari dashed off to buy snacks while Naruto fingered the money in his pocket. The old lady's fans sold for 4,000 yen. He had 4,300 yen. It was a lot of money. He remembered the way her face had lit up when he had given her the master level battle fan in the forest. Money wasn't that important after all. Chapter 14, Never Forgive, Never Forget. Tamari was practically bouncing as the two left the street fair. It was very unlike her to be this hyper, but she was slightly tipsy and on a sugar high, induced by four bags of mini donuts and too many free samples of sake. Naruto was following her at a distance looking slightly exasperated. About the only thing he had done in the last two hours was give Tamari the fan he had bought her. She loved it, and that alone made it worth the money, but Naruto was wishing he'd given it to her later. See, Tamari had quickly discerned that there was no reason she couldn't use wind jutsus with a smaller fan, combine that with her temper, her being only slightly drunk, and a sugar high, and what you got was a rather dangerous girl. She had already threatened a stall keeper who she claimed had cheated her, when in fact she had missed the target she had been aiming at. The man hadn't known why the strange young woman was waving her fan at him, and Naruto intervened before a small windstorm disrupted the fair. It was then decided that it was time to go back. So now, the two were walking back to their hotel, except that random things in the vicinity regularly distracted Tamari. It wasn't that she wasn't moving, she was just moving very slowly. Finally, Naruto settled for the same method he had used to get her to leave the room in the first place, he just took hold of her hand and started off at a high pace. Eventually, Tamari started to calm down, and a few blocks from the hotel she pulled her hand from Naruto's. When they arrived, Naruto said he wanted to go for a run, so Tamari went back to the room alone and flopped down onto her bed, covering her head with her hands. She was confused. Her entire life had really been a very simple process. She had gone to the academy, become a shinobi, and the theoretical continuation of her life should have included a perfect mission record until she was a jounin and a lifetime of service to her village. In her entire life, she had really only ever had to deal with four males on a regular basis. Her father, who was an ass, who Tamari ignored, Baki, whose two passions in life were being melodramatic and playing go fish, who Tamari was indifferent to, Gara, who had been insane most of her life, and who she had been mostly afraid of, and Konkuro, whose main hobby was pissing her off, who she beat on. She now found herself in a situation where she had a new person to deal with and a new life to plan for. For all her efforts, Naruto was an enigma to her. He wasn't anything like anyone she had ever met before. At first, she had been afraid of him, but that fear was vanishing faster every day. The more she thought about it, the more human he became. Naruto had never hurt her in any way, quite the contrary in fact. He had been nothing but kind and generous. It was, she justified, his fault she was in this position in the first place, but she doubted most kidnappers were as nice as he was. But for all that, she had never yet managed to shake the memory of how she had first seen him on the field of battle, his eyes burning with a dark inner fire as she found herself frozen in terror. But equally impossible was it to forget how just this afternoon he had been so sweet.
never once complaining, always complimenting her when she won a game, and picking out that fan for her. Tamari rubbed her temples, all this thinking was giving her a headache. Baki sat with his face firm, his eyes unwavering as he stared across the table at his opponent. Gara stared back, undaunted, his whole body perfectly still. Konkuro, the moderator, sat between them, a deck of cards sitting unopened in his hand. Championship matches were always held with a fresh deck. It was also tradition that each player had to bet something of personal value. Baki took out a katana passed down in his family for three generations and set it down. Not willing to be outdone, Gara set his special edition of Icha Icha Paradise, the motion picture down on the table. Baki's eyes widened. The stakes were high indeed. Konkuro carefully unwrapped the cards, shuffled them, and slowly started to deal. The tension built until both players had their hands ready and Konkuro placed the deck in the middle of the table. The puppet master raised his hand and brought it down dramatically, go, fish. Naruto ran. He found himself reminiscing, as his afternoon with Tamari had reminded him of times long past. Of another afternoon he had spent with another person who could smile so brightly, despite the hardship they were dealing with. He wondered idly what it was that gave Haku and Tamari the ability to do that. As always, he was soon lost deep in the depths of his mind. As Zabuza stood immobile, Kakashi had started to lecture about how Zabuza's ambitions were too dangerous and how no shinobi should act that way. Zabuza laughed, I don't give a damn, I fight for my ideals, and that shall continue. It was a statement made by someone who in his heart, knew he had lost, but the demon of the mist had never given up. For the first time in months, tears started to run down Naruto's face as he ran through the city. He could remember it as if he were still there, Zabuza already half dead, taking on a horde with nothing but a kunai in his mouth, fighting with all his soul to protect the memory of his precious person. The boy continued to let these dark memories roll over him, when he suddenly stopped. Naruto had been running for many minutes and was atop a bridge, looking down at a flowing river. He suddenly pulled out his forehead protector, examining it. Everything about it was the same as when he had modified it months before, the kanji for demonic mirage staring back at him. It was then that he realized he'd made an error in judgment. He had been worrying ever since he left Konoha about whether he would be able to live up to Zabuza's legacy, whether he was worthy of holding the demon sword. He realized as he stood atop that bridge that he had been foolish in thinking either of those things were what had made Zabuza great. It didn't matter how strong he was, as long as he was strong enough to protect his ideals and what was precious to him. Both Zabuza and Haku had tried to live like that, and had both died without regret in trying. Naruto released his forehead protector and watched as it fell and landed with a tiny splash in the water. Kakashi had said that fighting only for your ideals and those precious to you was no way to be a ninja. If that were true, Naruto didn't want to be one. He slowly turned and walked back towards the hotel, feeling refreshed. He had Sere Kirite, and Tamari smile. He had strength, and a precious person to protect. Baki fought to maintain his composure as he felt hundreds of eyes on him. Shortly after the start of their game, the Hokage had interrupted, and as any form of gambling immediately entranced Tsunade, everyone who was looking for the Hokage had come to their tent. Soon, the tent had been disassembled around their ears as more people wanted to watch, but the game had never paused. Both players were cautious, the game was more than half over, with Gara showing a one-pair lead. More people gathered, and some were standing on chairs to see over the throng. Somewhere in the crowd, a Chonin had set up some huge speakers and was playing Eye of the Tiger. Baki made a daring move, Gara, do you have any fives? The crowd collectively held their breath, until Gara slowly pulled a card from his hand and passed it over. Everyone burst into cheers and claps, waiting anxiously for Gara to make his move. Elsewhere in camp, Iruko was fretting. There were too many delays, his squad would have to start the hunt now, without returning to Konoha first. This was very unusual, but time was of the essence. Iruka had taken the initiative and ordered a group meeting without consulting Tsunade, he had ordered his team to get ready to leave in four hours. Now came the problem. Iruka would have to explain to the Hokage exactly why it was he was breaking regulation and going behind her back. But he would make her understand, he had to. This was their only chance. As Iruka planned his departure, Naruto was just arriving back to the hotel. The first thing Tamari noticed from her prone position was that he seemed more, invigorated than he had when he'd left. His eyes had just a bit more fire behind them. He grinned, I hope you're enjoying your break. Tomorrow, we leave the city and train. Tamari looked skeptical, train? Shouldn't we be putting more distance between our pursuers and us? Naruto shook his head, 
running is mostly pointless, they will find us eventually, and so we'll travel only a few hours a day and devote ourselves to training. With that, Naruto walked over to his bed and flopped on it. The two lay there, unmoving, basking in the fact that, at least for now, they could relax. Far away, Baki stood among a cheering crowd, holding Gara's special edition tape above him proudly. Minus eight days later. Hayuga Neji ran through the forest. They had been traveling constantly since the departure from the Konoha camp, and it was suspected that they would soon find their prey. He knew the others were somewhere nearby, but it was his job to initiate contact. After that, he was just supposed to fight as hard and as long as possible. He only accepted his task because he trusted in his team to uphold their part in the plan. Neji understood the role he was to play, but that didn't mean he liked it. Tamari stood behind Naruto in the forest, her hands guiding his through unfamiliar motions. She was finding it interesting how something that felt so natural to her could be so alien to someone else. She was also finding it mildly awing how fast Naruto was able to learn jutsus. He was slightly clumsy, but held the huge fan confidently, it had taken her three months to learn the basic kamaitachi, it took him only seven days. Tamari was feeling weak. On the other hand, she was infinitely stronger than when she had been kidnapped. Her progress with Kaze Nenshao no Justu had been swift, and she was now able to make the slicing winds hot, if not scorching. She had also, at Naruto's request, continued to practice Mizu Joshoku no Jutsu, and had become adept at that as well. Naruto hesitated in his motion and Tamari snapped back to reality. His hands had slipped so she replaced his hands in the correct places and took a step back, try it again. He nodded and again started the motions. Tamari had explained that it simply wasn't possible to try to use a fan in combat without knowing at least a little of the taijutsu that went along with the huge weapons. The San Nin looked over at Kyuubi's practice, and was, as always, impressed. Sarei Kirite was stuck in the ground, surrounded by trees. The demon was trying to manifest and destroy the trees farther and farther away, using the least amount of chakra possible. Kyuubi had been practicing with Naruto or by himself almost constantly, because if there was one thing the demon hated, it was weakness. As amazing as it was watching huge glowing red appendages tear apart a forest, the boy and demon together were even more astounding. The two had been practicing synchronizing their thoughts and perceptions, and now both could see into a bit of each other's minds. All these thoughts passed through Tamari's mind as she came to her arch nemesis, the water balloon. This had been her assigned practice for the afternoon. She had been nervous when Naruto had grinned so much while explaining what she would be trying to do, and now she understood why. The thing just wouldn't break. She could spin the water with her chakra, but never managed to get anything close to the pulsating and exploding that Naruto had achieved with so little apparent effort. It was pissing her off, to say the least. Naruto let out a yell as he finally got the motions right, not slipping or hesitating once. He looked at Tamari to find her glaring heatedly at the small water-filled object in her hand. He knew she didn't have the chakra capacity yet for a full-fledged Rasengan, but intended for her to at least start practicing. He had been serious when he had said he was going to teach her everything he knew. Naruto glanced at the sky, Ni, Tamari, supper sounds good right now, you done practicing? Tamari threw the balloon violently against a tree as Naruto retrieved his sword. He took that as a yes. He passed her fan back to her and they walked the short distance back to camp. So what is it today? The boy asked, dehydrated rice or dehydrated rice? Hard choice, Tamari muttered. Naruto just grabbed a pot and started the five-minute walk to the river, humming to himself. When he arrived, his hand flew immediately to the blade on his back. Someone was watching him. Naruto turned to the left, and found a pair of white eyes looking upon him with hatred. He slowly removed his hand from Sarei Kirite's handle, Yo, Neji. I was wondering when someone would show up. The Hayuga's glare became even darker, I was told not to confront you if we met, but I don't need a team to beat scum like you, Byakugan. The veins burst out around Neji's eyes as Naruto responded with a smile, that's a little arrogant, isn't it? But I'll tell you what, since you're going to be so brave, I won't even remove the sword from my back, that should make it at least amusing. Neji practically boiled with rage as he charged. Naruto noticed that Neji had become much faster, and it took some effort for Naruto to dodge the Hayuga's first few punches. Soon, the two were exchanging blows at a steady pace. Naruto was starting to get mildly concerned, as Neji wasn't using his gentle fist, just ordinary punches. Leaping back, Naruto opted for his usual, and created a small army of shadow clones and ordered them to attack. The fight that followed really wasn't anything new. Neji fought methodically, 
slowly reducing the number of clones until Akaiden removed the last five. He had to admit, Neji had gotten much better, but Naruto really didn't have time to play with the Hyuga. The two closed again and now Naruto could feel the telltale chakra surrounding Neji's hands. They were playing for keeps this time. Neji glared yet again, only slightly out of breath, and fell into a stance Naruto remembered all too well, do you have any last words? Knowing Neji had the honor to wait while he decided what to say, Naruto had an idea sent an image to the fox, can we pull this off, Naruto mentally asked. Yep the fox replied, and Naruto could feel the demon's grin. Without killing Neji? I suppose. The fox's grin grew wider. Back in the real world, Naruto felt his perception extend as he and Kyuubi cinched their thoughts. He looked up at Neji, I have words to say, and I want you to never forget them. The Hyuga nodded slightly, but his eyes widened as Naruto fell into a stance that mirrored his own. The fox boy smirked, it's over, you are within the field of my haki. Neji's only response was to attack, gentle fist style, hands of haki. Two hands. Neji called. Four hands. Naruto called simultaneously. If Neji was shocked when Naruto called out at the same time he did, he was even more shocked when Naruto successfully blocked two strikes and landed two of his own. Neji knew it was impossible for any non Hyuga to use the hands of Haki, and yet Naruto was doing it, and starting with four. Despite all this, Neji refused to be intimidated, Naruto wouldn't be able to keep up with his speed forever. 4. 8. Neji growled as his four strikes were blocked, and he felt four strikes land on his body. 8. 16. Again, Neji was thwarted. 16. 32. Neji was slightly worried, this shouldn't be possible. 32. 64. His body was in agony as Naruto blocked all 32 of his strikes and landed 32 of his own. 64. 128. He had won. Naruto's strikes had always missed slightly, Neji had some burnt in Ketsu, but none were completely closed. Naruto was doing the impossible, imitating a Hyuga skill of the highest level, but there was no way to block his next attack. 128 was as many strikes as the greatest of Hyuga could manage. 120A. Neji stopped. Halfway through his final strike, two wickedly clawed red arms manifested from the sword on Naruto's back. Haki, Demon Claw. 256 hands. Neji tried to block, but it was impossible. All four arms were striking with godlike speed, and where Naruto missed the Tenketsu, the demonic arms had perfect aim. The final blow was landed on Neji's chest, sending him flying back. He smashed into a tree and fell to the ground, unmoving. Naruto snorted as the QB dissipated his arms, the Hyuga really were stupid. The greatest attack they had required that their enemies be slower than them, in one place, and limited to two arms. Beyond that, when all was said and done, the hands of Haki were rarely lethal. Then again, he thought, on the positive side, he had gotten his first field test of his and Kyuubi's mind sink. He had been impressed when, in practice sessions, Kyuubi's perception had shown the ability to give a blurry image of the chakra systems of nearby people. Naruto sighed, picked up his pot, and headed back to camp. Unfortunately, they didn't have time for supper anymore. As soon as he set foot in camp, he had an idea of what had happened. Tamari was nowhere to be seen. Her fan was lying near the fire. She would never have left without it. Sitting on the ground was his magnetic chess set, only three pieces on the board. A black king and black queen were being pincered by a white knight. It was a position where the knight could take either the king or queen on his next turn. The only way for the black king to survive is to sacrifice the black queen to his opponent. The whole thing with Neji had been a setup. The bastards had taken Tamari. Naruto growled and gripped Sere Kirite's handle. They had gone too far this time. He was done with holding back. Chapter 15, Theirs is but to do and die. Naruto paced restlessly around camp, cursing his own stupidity. It seemed so obvious in retrospect, the leaf didn't dare attack him head on. Naruto was now sure that the hunters didn't know what his relationship with Tamari was, and so they couldn't risk that she was still just his prisoner. So the only thing they could do was take her and interrogate her. Naruto resisted the powerful urge to destroy something. He needed to be calm, his opponents were smart, and so he had to be too. Taking a deep breath, Naruto analyzed the situation. From his enemy's perspective, taking Tamari served many purposes. Finding out whether she was a voluntary nuknin, or whether Naruto had forced her. Finding out about Naruto's tactics and skills, picking apart what she knew about his mind. The problem was, 
Naruto didn't know how Tamari would answer. Would she betray him to the leaf? Would she resist and risk her life? Would she just sit silently and not respond? He cursed and punched a tree. Worst of all was that he knew the final and most obvious reason for kidnapping Tamari was that it would drive Naruto crazy wondering whether the girl was dead, and unfortunately, it was working. He forced himself to be calm. Tamari could take care of herself, and fighting while mad was the worst thing a person could do. Now focused, he started examining the campsite more closely. He could determine many things about the hunter squad just from looking at their work. There was no sign of a struggle, so Tamari had been surprised. Naruto could personally attest to the fact that this was no small feat, so there was at least one jounin on the team. The positioning of the chess pieces was a brilliant psychological taunt, so he was facing someone who either was very smart or knowledgeable about the workings of the human mind. Considering Neji's presence, Naruto was betting that the chess was the work of Shikamaru. They were hoping to weaken his resolve by forcing him to fight his ex-friends. Two hours ago, it might have worked. Neji was badly wounded, and assuming Tamari was just unconscious, he refused to think otherwise, they wouldn't be able to transport her very far, they knew that they were giving Naruto a major chance to escape either way, and wouldn't let themselves be more than an hour from his position. If he moved fast, he should be able to find them within five hours using a crisscross pattern. Wasting no more time, he dashed off into the forest, heading back to where he had last seen Neji. If he centered his search there, he might get lucky and find the hunters within the hour. Iruka and Shizun ran through the forest, Shizun carrying Neji in her arms. She had been horrified after only a brief examination and immediately declared that he needed to get to a real hospital, as she didn't have the resources to treat him in the forest. Since Iruka was the only one who wasn't needed immediately as part of the plan, he was her escort and guard. Shizun would run with Neji if Naruto found them, leaving Iruka to cover their escape. Iruka understood better than anyone that his team was the best for the job, but he still worried as he pushed himself, trying to move as fast as humanly possible. He had left Iviki in charge, but still wished he could be there himself. He was broken out of his thoughts as Neji moaned, and he turned to see the Hyuga starting to shift in Shizun's arms. Iruka cursed and started to run faster, he wasn't going to let anyone die. Tamari slowly awoke, but trying to think was like swimming through mud. She tried to move, and upon finding she couldn't, sighed silently. She was really getting tired of waking up groggy and immobile. She kept her eyes closed and stayed perfectly still, not wanting to alert anyone as to her wakefulness. She could feel all her body parts, and that was a good sign, but missing was the comforting weight of her shuriken holsters and battle fan. Without much hope, she shifted her weight slightly and was surprised when she felt all her hidden kunai exactly where they were supposed to be. Whoever had taken all her obvious weaponry hadn't bothered to search her. As an experiment, she shifted again and felt a lump. Tamari had tucked the small fan Naruto had given at the fair into her sash for safekeeping. It was still there. Not wasting time searching her for concealed weapons was understandable if there were time constraints, but the small wood fan in her sash was obvious, and anyone who didn't bother to take a fan from a wind user, even a tied-up wind user, would have to be either the most powerful or laziest shinobi in existence. A short distance away, an oblivious Shikamaru sat staring at clouds. He had taken the least troublesome job, as everyone else was out patrolling the forest. His mind, happily distracted by floating white puffs, paid very little attention to his, supposedly, unconscious prisoner. Behind him, Tamari carefully opened her eyes. She immediately recognized Shikamaru, which answered the question of who had tied her up and failed to search her, but didn't tell her what to do next. The shadow user was leaning up against a tree, facing away from her and staring at the sky. Tamari could feel one her hidden kunai in her right sleeve, if she could reach it, cutting herself would be simple. The only obstacle was Shikamaru, Tamari knew she would have to be very careful and quiet, because if the pineapple-haired boy noticed she was awake and caught wind of her plan, she would be sunk. She started to move, agonizingly slowly, shifting her body so the hidden kunai would slide out of its hiding place. She knew it might take a while at this speed, but impatience could ruin her only chance of escape. Iviki and Anko stood uneasily in the forest. Both knew that everything was going according to plan, but neither could shake the nervousness that came with waiting. Provoking an enraged demon boy to attack you seemed like a much better idea around a planning table surrounded by your teammates. Iruka had said flatly that despite how much the boy may have changed, there was no way Naruto would abandon someone he had decided was his responsibility. The plan had developed logically from there, kidnap Tamari when the two Nukenins were apart, then allow Naruto to come to them. Kakashi had been the one to capture Tamari, and everything had seemed perfect until Shizun had arrived at the rendezvous point with Neji's broken body. 
they had all assumed Neji would at least be able to hold his own against Naruto for a few minutes. They had been wrong. Now they were short three members, leaving only one to guard Tamari and four people split into two man teams on the lookout for the fox boy. Neji had been Chonin level, and he had been completely and utterly crushed. That left even the Jounin slightly disturbed. It was for this reason, that as they watched the silent forest, Iviki had lost his usual aura of casualness and Anko was completely serious. Tension was thick in the air as they stood back to back in the forest, neither could put a finger on exactly what it was that was bothering them, but the disturbance was there nonetheless. It was then that the mist started to form. The leaf nin resisted the immediate urge to set off their signal flares, they didn't want to call Kakashi and Tenten to back them up unless they were sure the mist wasn't a diversion. Within the fog, Naruto stood calmly holding Sere Kirite. Iviki and Anko couldn't see him, but he could see them. He was one with his sword and one with his surroundings. It wasn't a feeling that could be described to someone who hadn't felt it, as he couldn't see things around him, but he knew they were there all the same. He knew the position of every tree, rock and plant for twenty feet in every direction. He felt rather than saw the agitated movements of the two Jounin in front of him, but it really didn't matter. He knew where they were, and they had no idea where he was. His eyes narrowed and shone with a dark inner light. Both Jounin easily dogged Naruto's initial strike, as their instincts had been honed from a hundred battles, but the boy went straight into high gear. He knew that both Leaf Nins had much larger ninjutsu collections than his own, and so he would have to pressure them so much they had no time for jutsus. Kyuubi's eight Sere Kirite clones were already in the air, and Naruto had directed the demon to focus on Iviki, leaving Naruto himself to deal with Anko. Said female Leaf Nin was currently pulling off her best acrobatics in an effort to dodge Sere Kirite and the dark boy who wielded it like it weighed no more than a kunai. Anko had known the boy would be strong, but her current situation was ridiculous. She suddenly saw an opening in Naruto's defense and went for it. Seeing the kunai aimed at his heart, Naruto jumped, taking his sword into an upward slash. Knowing it was too late to reverse her momentum Anko brought her two kunai down to block, and they held for a second, but were no match for the demonic blade. Both kunai were cut cleanly in half and Sere Kirite continued upwards, almost severing his left leg and leaving a deep gash in her side. Naruto would have reversed the blade and come down on her for the killing blow but felt an explosion behind him. He spun in the air, kicking Anko out of the way as he did so. Iviki just stood there, grinning at him. The interrogator's right side had been completely mangled by Kyuubi's spinning sword clones, his right arm and leg in shreds, but in his left hand he held a flare gun. Naruto's eyes widened as Iviki continued to grin as he collapsed. The fox boy growled, baring his fangs as he ran to pick up his bag and Tamari's battle fan before continuing towards where he figured the leaf camp would be. Unfortunately, the explosion had completely awoken Shikamaru from his oblivion, and he was now standing alertly above as Tamari faked sleep. She had the kunai in her hand, but hadn't cut her bonds yet and if she moved it would be a battle of speed between her and the shadow user to see who would strike first. Deciding she had to risk it, Tamari cut the ropes on her hands and brought the kunai down to cut her leg bonds while her other hand grabbed the fan out of her sash. Shikamaru immediately noticed her movement out of the corner of his eye and was starting the seals for the shadow bind when a chibi kamaitachi slammed into the side of his head. Shikamaru crumpled to the ground and Tamari jumped to her feet, trying to get the blood flowing in her limbs again. Oddly enough, in all her plans to escape it had never occurred to her that she was now willingly acting like a missing nin. Not willing to waste time contemplating this fact, as the flare probably meant trouble for Naruto, Tamari started to run in the direction of where the flare had gone off. The ex San Nin hadn't gotten very far when she felt two presences right behind her. Just as she was pondering how to get away, a form sped in front of her and cut her off. Tamari found herself facing one normal eye and one Sharingan, and knew she was in rather deep trouble. Kakashi glared, why are you trying to escape? Tamari just smiled, because you captured me, isn't it normal to run away? Then why haven't you run away from him, Kakashi said angrily. Tamari's mind was working at warp speed, despite her outward confidence, she had no hope of winning. She didn't have her fan or any time to prepare a plan of acti. Prepare. Suddenly all of Naruto's annoying comments made sense. Mizu Joshuku no Jutsu and Kaze Nenshao no Justu weren't supposed to be combined, one was a preparation for the other. Willing to gamble, she ignored Kakashi's question and started to run through now familiar seals. As expected, the copy ninja held true to his name and immediately started to imitate her seals. They both finished the seals and called out at the same time, Mizu Joshuku no Jutsu. Neither moved as the water started to gather. Within seconds, both were soaked and the air around them was filled with water droplets. 
Kakashi was perplexed. He had been slightly nervous when Tamari had started into hand seals without answering his question, but the jutsu didn't do anything except make you wet. Tamari just stood there, hoping beyond hope that Naruto was nearby, if he weren't, Kakashi would be kicking her ass any minute now. It was at that moment that Tenten fell from the trees. Literally. The weapons master hit the ground with a crunch and lay still. Kakashi's Sharingan started to spin as he looked at Tenten, he felt righteous anger building up inside him and subconsciously started the hand seals for Chidori. He probably would have finished them too if Sarei Kirite hadn't flown out of the trees, heading straight to Tamari. If the huge sword flying towards her unnerved the girl, she didn't show it. A million possibilities went through Kakashi's mind. Was Naruto going to kill her and blame it on the leaf? As the blade was only a few fractions of a second from impact, Tamari reached out with her hand and deftly caught her fan as the Sarei Kirite clone puffed into non-existence. Using the fan's own momentum to snap it open and spin, Tamari forced all the chakra she had into one final jutsu. Kaze Nenshao no Justu, Kikaki. Burning Wind's Technique, Vaporizer. All the water that had collected on her body and in the air turned instantly to steam as the air was lit on fire. Kakashi only managed the Oshi. Before he was engulfed by a wave of superheated mist and consumed by agony. Some of the steam condensed on the copy ninja's body and continued to burn him as he thrashed on the ground. When the air started to cool and clear up, Kakashi just lay on his back, trying not to move. A shadow suddenly fell over him and he met a set of dark red eyes. I suppose this is the end for the great copy ninja? Kakashi said without mirth. Naruto shook his head, no, there's a message I want you to take to Tsunade for me. Kakashi raised his singed eyebrow, go ahead, I'm not going anywhere. Naruto thought for a moment and started casually, as far as I know, your whole team is alive, assuming Iviki and Anko managed to use healing jutsus before they bled to death, so you can be happy about that. More importantly, I want you to know that if I ever catch even a whiff of the scent of leaf hunters ever again, I'm going to find and kill them while they sleep. Naruto grinned slightly, and if anyone from your village ever lays a hand on one of my precious people ever again. Naruto's eyes suddenly started to glow, then I will go back to Konoha and burn it to the ground. Naruto's eyes lost their glow and he smiled again, do we understand each other? Kakashi nodded painfully. Good, Naruto turned to Tamari, who had been panting while leaning on her fan. Ready? Tamari nodded tiredly, the sun had set, but at that moment she wanted to get far away from their current location as possible. Without further exchange of words, the two Nuknin started to run. Tsunade shot upwards in bed, her body soaked with cold sweat. She had been having a horrible nightmare, but couldn't remember any of what it had been about. She rested a hand on her chest and felt her heart pounding. The fifth was not the type of person to be superstitious, but she would swear for the rest of her life that as she lay there in bed, she somehow knew the team sent after Naruto had been beaten. Feeling a dark sense of dread well up from deep within her, she remembered that she had once read part of a poem that she had thought effectively summed up the life of a shinobi. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. Into the valley of death. Rode the 600. She had only sent 8 people, not 600, but she had sent them on a mission not because the village needed Naruto, but because she as a person cared about him. If they died, she knew she would never forgive herself their deaths. Only a short distance away, Sabaku no Gara sat on the ground, watching the moon. He sat cross-legged, staring up into the sky wondering how Tamari was doing. He would be the first to admit that he had never exactly showered his siblings with affection, but Tamari's absence had been affecting him deeply. Gara had been pondering something the Hokage had said to him a few days earlier, that you don't know what you have until it's gone. He was finding that to be disturbingly true. The sand shifted slightly as someone sat down beside him. It took Gara only a moment to realize it was Konkuro lacking his face paint and body suit. The sand settled and the two sat in silence, the only sound being the wind as it rustled through the trees. Finally, it was Gara who broke the silence, not sleeping well? Hmm, no, not really Konkuro answered, only half paying attention. Seems quiet without her, doesn't it? Hmm, Konkuro answered again. How do you think she's doing? Okay I guess, she's with that Naruto kid, and he's tough as nails said Konkuro. Gara nodded with a small smile, that he is. And so they sat in silence, each reflecting on their own thoughts. Tamari collapsed against a tree in exhaustion sometime around 3 a.m. Naruto had decided they had gone far enough that they weren't likely to be found. He set up the two sleeping bags next to each other, and helped Tamari to hers before stripping to the waist and crawling into his own. 
the two really hadn't spoken since their flight from the battlefield, and a great deal was hanging awkwardly between them. Most of the awkwardness was on Tamari's side, and she felt the need to talk despite her fatigue. I wanted, too, I guess, say, thank you. Naruto just looked confused, for what? Tamari's nervousness was suddenly replaced with incredulity, for coming to help me escape. Naruto thought for a moment then let out a dark laugh, don't thank me for that. I went against my village, and don't care if people call me scum, but shinobi who leave their comrades behind are worse than scum, and even I refuse to sink that low. He suddenly rolled over so they were facing each other, but even beyond that, you are on the very short list of people who are precious to me. Tamari tried to cover a blush as Naruto continued, if you ever want to leave, I won't stop you, but until that day, anyone who wants to mess with you has to kill me first. Tamari just lay there as Naruto rolled back over, and a few minutes later, started to snore. When she did start to drift herself, her mind was still filled with the memory of his final words. Alright everyone, that's it for the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I will try to post more as soon as possible. I have already posted the full story over on my Patreon if you are interested in that, link to that is in the description. Anyways, until next time, peace.